Campbelltown, the wee toon, or the world's whiskey capital, Spiritville, Whiskey City, Whiskeyopolis, and still a cult following to this day. But how can that be from a region where the entire output is less than Glengoyne? Well, that's what we're here to try and find out. Hello, whiskey folk. How is everyone? Fantastic to see you all. Wonderful to welcome you here to another Thursday night scheduled VPUB. These are going out weekly just now. Well, for obvious reasons, I don't even want to mention the C word tonight. If we can get through another stream without mentioning it, we'll be doing very, very well. But in the context of the world and our background right now, that's why there's kind of weekly VPUBs going out at this moment in time. There's also less structured, more relaxed Sunday evening uh, sessions going out as well uh, called Extended Opening. Um, I'm very glad to welcome you in on any of the sessions that you're able to join. And of course, if you're picking this up on the replay, thank you so much for picking it up uh, afterwards. The Thursday night sessions tend to have some kind of theme or structure or some kind of topic that we can talk about and discuss a little bit. So there is a bit of a value for people to pick it up in the replay. The Sunday night sessions are more a just, uh, just a good old whiskey community hangout. Wonderful to welcome you. so many of you in. There was well over 100 of you waiting again before the, the pub doors were opened. It's fantastic to see that support. And I just like to jump in and welcome some of you guys in the lounge. If you're in the live chat, Hopefully you've picked up how to access that live chat now. It's If you're watching it on YouTube in the, on a desktop, it's a button just underneath here, uh, live chat. And if it's on a mobile device, you can turn it into portrait mode that way and it'll pop up. You're able to hit the live chat button and interact that way. If you're watching on Facebook, you can use the comments underneath uh, to try and get my attention and interact that way as well. I'll just switch on the Facebook comments too. Good. Um, Wonderful stuff. I hope you're all interested in the topic tonight. It's one that I had been planning for a little while, but I've kind of been pulling forward topics because I'm going through many of them just now in order to bring you weekly content. So if you've got any ideas, something that you think might work as a really good VPUB to topic, I'd be more than happy to hear from you. You can email me at whiskeyaquavitae.com or through any of the regular social media channels, or just simply leave a comment right down below. Andrew, Page is here and he's just bought me a very generous virtual dram. He's saying, good evening, Roy. Thanks for doing this. Andrew, good evening to you. Welcome and thank you for the virtual dram, my friend. I'll raise this glass of Springbank, nine-year-old local barley and say slancha, Andrew. Thank you very much, my friend. And also welcomed another couple of Aquavite Barfly members in tonight, my friend from California, Bill Dull. And I believe... Um, I'm trying to remember who else it was that, that joined earlier. I think it was the whiskey something that flashed past. Um, regardless, I do apologise. Thank you for joining and uh, welcome to both of you. Um, let's see who's in tonight. Uh, my friend Craig Dolier, wonderful evening. He's saying evening, guys and gals. Fantastic to see you in, Craig. Nice to welcome you here again. Arnie Tiger is here saying hello, Roy. Good, good to see you, Arnie. Uh, Daniel Vermas, Precarious Dave, excellent Dave, great to have you in again. Uh, Radek is here, Thomas Elmer, you star, good to see you Thomas. Marcus Kreitner, hopefully sat next to uh, Christina, sitting comfortably on their couch. I hope you're healthy, Marcus and Christina. Kino Hara is here, Tom Goosens, wonderful Tom, good to see you. Uh, I Laddie Whiskey Nerd, Billy Saunders, Jimmy Jazz, Eric Cunliffe, Gareth Thomason, uh, looks like a new Barfly member, Well, nice to welcome you in, Gareth. Uh, Gareth, wonderful to have you here. Cressamir is here, great to see you, my friend. Bud Jenkins saying, Billy Saunders, you're doing well in isolation. We're all having to cope a wee bit with uh, a whole different dynamic. And as the weeks tick on, it's becoming uh, a little bit more challenged in slightly different ways. Uh, I know it's a very small thing, but I'm really struggling with a haircut. I'm going to have to do a home job. 
Um, Richard Hall is here. Good to see you, Richard. NZ Anime Manga. Aaron McFault, my friend Aaron. Good to see you. Neil Cochran, also from Glasgow. Great to see you. And Neil Art Baggy, Jean de la Cuisine, Lee Kerwin, Matthew Parks, Richie Z, Donald Rance, Patrick, and Menno. Wonderful to see so many of you here. I hope you're comfortable. I hope you've got your feet up and I hope you've got something nice in your hand. Perhaps it's something from Campbelltown. I called this VPUB. Um, I gave it the title of All Roads uh, Lead to Campbelltown. Um, and obviously that's a play on all roads lead to Rome. It doesn't matter uh, what road you take, at some point you're going to end up in Rome. And in the whiskey world, um, I'm just kind of playing on that theme. I remember walking into the Leith vaults a couple of years ago and they had a huge mural up in the wall. I think they still have it there and it says all roads lead to the vaults. And I thought that was quite nice, but I'd always imagined that all roads lead to Isla. Certainly where I was in my whiskey journey at that point in time, I kind of felt that Isla for me was the kind of whiskey pinnacle, the whiskey capital. And I found it curious that they had that thing up there saying all roads lead to the vaults. And then as I sat there and I enjoyed my session at, over in Leith, I kind of reasoned that, yeah, I, that kind of makes sense. Um, this is not beginner whiskey I'm enjoying here. This is high ABV, single cask whiskey. This is a, a much more kind of connoisseur environment. Maybe, maybe this is where all roads lead to. Maybe this is the pinnacle of whiskey enjoyment. And then, of course, you just take a few more steps along your whiskey journey and realize that that changes quite quickly. But one thing I have noticed is that for many people, permit me to use sweeping generalizations, for many people that have been into whiskey for a long time, you talk about whiskey and you talk about whiskey and you talk about whiskey and then you start to talk about Campbelltown whiskies, spring banks, whatever it may be, whether it's a long row hazel burn or a regular spring or whatever, they just kind of sigh and say, ah, yes. And it's kind of that beacon, that icon of traditional, old school, bold, characterful, deeply layered and sometimes challenging whiskies that come from that region that people that are fairly mature in their whiskey journey find so compelling. I would struggle to think of many Campbellton whiskies that I would be pouring for people if they were just new into whiskey, if they were just kind of stepping out on their journey. And it's, it's nothing to do with, um, you know, the, me not thinking that they would enjoy them or anything, that, but there's just, there's much more challenging aspects to the Campbelltown whiskies. And some people would taste some of that kind of funk, that Campbelltown funk that's probably the easiest way to summarise it and talk about it. Some of the more kind of industrial or perhaps agricultural or earthy or more briny notes maybe. It seems to be a whiskey that resonates with people who are looking for the next thing. And that's what I want to explore tonight. I want to explore why is it like that? Because the three distilleries, the theoretical capacity of these distilleries are quite big. 750,000 litres or so for Springbank and Kilcarran, about a bit more than that, I think, from Glen Scotia. So, you know, quite large, but they're not producing anything like their capacity. And the combined volumes, as I said at the intro to this video, is less from that entire region, is less than what comes from Glen Goyne. So let us know what you think about uh, Campbelltown whiskies. We're going to do a little tour and I'm going to have a host, a virtual host, welcome us at Kilcarran, then Glen Scotia, and then eventually at Springbank. And over the course of those uh, three distilleries, we'll visit five brands, of course, because uh, Springbank are able to bring us three completely distillation processes, not just three different brands, but they're able to bring us triple distilled hazel burn, their, their standard uh, spring bank, which is two and a half times distilled, and then uh, double distilled, heavily peated long row. So five brands. And I'll have a host welcome us at each, each distillery, a little bit like uh, what we did for the Isla tour a couple of weeks ago. Let's see what you guys are saying. Lindsay Holman is in. Good to have you, Lindsay. Good to have you here. Love Kilkerran and the Springbank. Not had a Glen Scotia. Well, Glen Scotia, I think, are bringing out some fantastic whiskies now and certainly worth um, engaging with. But we'll talk a wee bit more about that when we go and visit uh, uh, Glen Scotia. Uh, Iladi is seen sipping a Hazelburn 10-year-old at the moment. Fantastic, Rombout. The perfect idea. I was actually thinking about when I poured this uh, local barley. And the only reason I didn't is that the Hazelburn is still sealed and intact. It's not that I'm against opening it. 
I, I may open it yet, but there's going to be one, two, maybe three bottles getting uncorked tonight in order to enjoy this wee mini tour. Greg, whiskey guy from France is in, he's saying, I get your point, so I'll make them try first if it still exists. A Mitchell's Blend, 12-year-old, or equivalent, Cadenhead, uh, and also a Glen Scotia, 1832, for travel retail, easy sippers and appealing. Yeah, but even that Glen Scotia 1832 is 46%. Mike Meyer has just bought me a dram. Mike, you star, thank you so much. Let me see if you've uh, made any comments with that. He said, thanks for all the great videos and VPubs. Mike, thank you for the generous dram, my friend. Slantia, I hope you're healthy and keeping well. Cheers. Orange Willis saying, Glen Scotia double cask. Perfect introduction to a Campbellton virgin. Absolutely. Um, non statement whiskey, but nice presentation. Again, 46%, uh, until filtered, not that expensive either. Glen Scotia double cask. Jimmy Legg, Blair is in, good to see you, Jimmy, saying starting with a Glen Cadam 10, but then opening a Springbank 15. So you're coming in starting some, with something a bit light, uh, very bourbon-esque, Glen Cadam 10, and then uh, uncorking your Springbank 15 a wee bit later. Excellent, Jimmy. Good to have you. Multi-Agus Muncher Matthews saying, I've done the Springbank tour more times than the other distilleries on my doorstep, and I'm six hours drive from, from the wee tune. Enough said. Matthew, you're going to get a confession out of me later tonight, and you might be shocked. Jay Francis is saying, uh, sipping a Cadenhead's red wine cask been run before going on to Kilkerran and Springbank. Good for you, Jay, and good to have you in. Greg's whiskey guy is saying, okay, then the recent Campbelltown Harbour, 40%, if not mistaken. <laughs> well done, Greg. Good for you. Um, I think the Campbelltown Loch blend is still available, perhaps. Matthew Parks is saying, what's your favourite cast strength Campbelltown whiskey? You're asking me, Matthew. I don't really have a favourite, but if I was to choose one, it would have to be the reliable um, Springbank 12 cast strength. comes out twice a year. Uh, varies batch to batch, of course, but for £55 thereabouts, uh, wonderful, compelling, characterful whiskey. Ebhead, Rolf is in. Good to see you, Rolf. Good to see my friend. He's saying, I am responsible for converting one friend into whiskey and was surprised to see him get hooked on Springbank from very early on. One size does not fit all. Absolutely, Rolf. One more person to compete with for new releases. <laughs> I'll probably mention that at the outset, actually, because we, we do need to draw some attention to the fact that the small output does mean that the releases tend to be quite small as well. And when you have a release of a long row red, about 9,000 bottles or something as an example, going out as a global release, it can mean that it's difficult to get your hands on them. It's frustrating in Scotland when you have to put your name down on a list and you just sometimes don't get the call or you don't hear anything about it. The, the long row reds don't even touch the shelf. Um, and that's true for so many releases uh, uh, from from those guys. And it's just the way it is when the releases come out. Some people are ready to start their sprint early. They're prepared. They know where to go. They've got uh, their names on multiple lists, perhaps. I tend to, I tend to take a, a moment just to kind of put it up, to, just put it into the hands of fate and say, look, if this whiskey's meant for me, it's not going to go past me. I don't want to get into a clamour. I don't want to get into a fight for it. And I have to say that I've got so much whiskey here that it's very rare that an example of the style comes along that's going to be so, so different from stuff that I already have that it's actually worth the fight. So I tend to wait. And then if there's an opportunity comes up where I can get my hands on it, yes, of course, I tend to try and take it. But I try not to fight for it these days. Vlad is here. You start he's saying, hi, Roy, good... Uh, to good health, my friend, with a Springbank 12 cast strength 2020 in my hand. I uncorked that very one on a Sunday night V-Pub recently, a couple of weeks ago, Vlad, and I found it to be delicious. Absolutely fantastic. In fact, you'll see it just over my right shoulder here. Uh, all three of those Springbank 12s are open, and I'm enjoying them very much. On the left, I've got a selection of uh, Hazelburn, Long Row, uh, various Springbanks things. Over here, I've got uh, Glen Scotia, that's the 16, a travel retail. I've also got the Victoriana here alongside me. And when we arrive, when our bus pulls up outside uh, Glen Scotia, that's the one I think I'll be uncorking today, Victoriana. We can't find a rarest in Aquavidi. You can always ask me the non-profit drug. Well, yes, you are a bit of a dealer. You are a bit of an enabler, Doc. Um, 
a McAllen Fine Rare, the dock over in Germany sometimes happens upon a good deals, flash sales, things like that. And uh, he puts a little uh, message out and gets encourages us to spend our money. Um, fantastic it is as well, Doc. Fantastic service. Whiskey Influencer is in. He's saying, uh, exactly, that's Tim, isn't it, Tim? Exactly. You can't expect to get every release. If you don't get one today, maybe you'll get something else in the future. And it's the money and the liver and the shelf space and the you know, trying to keep that thing that we all suffer from, that bottle chasing thing, that fear of missing out, just trying to force yourself to keep it in check a little bit as well. Espen uh, Anderson is in as well, just bought me a dram, you star, I am drinking Springbank Green, 13 years today, love the V-Pub, Skoll from Norway. Skoll, Espen, wonderful to have you in, my friend, and thank you so much for your virtual dram. Mm. Anthony Dunn is here. Hi, Roy. Keep safe and well. Uh, I've worked tomorrow, so bedtime. We'll catch this on the replay. Hope everyone has great whiskey to enjoy during these odd times. Almost 300 of you in. Anthony, thank you so much, my friend. I'll raise a glass to you and everybody that's joined us tonight and say safe health uh, to everyone. Slán I've forgotten that this uh, spring bank is cast strength. The local barley is cast strength. I think it's 57, 57.7%. But it's lovely. It's lovely stuff. Pete Harrison, your plant in the background is cheering for Campbelltown also. It's moving continuously. The plant in the background is uh, occasionally being blown by a fan that's sitting atop a cabinet across to the side. We have to try and keep the room um, a wee bit cool with all these uh, machines and lights in here. Thank you, Pete Head. Uh, David Evans is saying it. Evening, Aquavite. And hi, everyone. Jimmy Legacy and Aquavite. How do you rate the 18 year old Springbank? For me, it's the least interesting. Oh, wow. No, not at all. Not at all. Uh, my, the 18 year old I have here is still sealed. The last 18 I had, I tore through at an, an alarming rate. I loved it. I found it to be very rich and delicious. Shared it with the Whiskey Rev, actually, and he felt the same way. Graham Fraser is saying, recently picked up new bottles of Glen Scotia, Campbelltown Harbour and Double Cask, so crack those open in the V-Pub tonight, Roy. Just before I go ahead and bring my uh, friend in, actually, just quickly, Pete James has bought me uh, a virtual drama and he said, I love Springbank. Cheers. Cheers to you, Pete. I do too, my friend, Slancha. Lots and lots of live streams going out just now. Everybody kind of pitching in to try and bring content to keep everybody engaged. Um, I, I guess if uh, if you wanted to, I think you could find a whiskey tube live stream every single night. That's just inside YouTube. Um, and then you go out and, and into the virtual tastings that we're finding on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and everywhere. Lots and lots of stuff to watch out for. Uh, later tonight, there's a, a live stream. I noticed Phil and Deepa were on earlier, actually, doing a cool little session. Um, I had them on the background as I was as I was setting up. Um, later tonight, the Scotch for Dummies, I'm sure, will be live tonight as well, so you can head on over to their channel. If you're in European time zones, it might be a bit late, 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, I guess, for you guys. Um, but if you're, if you're west of us, Scotch for Dummies, and those guys are celebrating 10,000 subscribers as well. Um, they'll have to be uh, practicing social distancing, of course, so it'll maybe be the four of them dialing in like they did on the recent Blind Challenge live stream. Also, tomorrow evening, um, uh, Tomatin, a few weeks back before the lockdown festival, this has been scheduled for a long time, Tomatin has invited the Scotch Test Dummies and myself to join them for their softer sessions live tomorrow evening, which goes out at 9pm UK, 10pm uh, European, which is 5pm it's going to be 4 p.m. actually, Eastern time in the U.S. Uh, so if you want to come along and hang with us tomorrow night on the Tomatin uh, channel, it's not going out here, it's going out on the Tomatin channel. I'll be able to uh, welcome you there, perhaps. Great stuff. Andy Calderwood is here saying some great live streams going on. Picked up Glen Allachie earlier, really enjoying all the content. I have to say it's a direct reflection of the fact that we're a wee bit stuck and where we'd normally begin out to events or tastings, maybe a night at the pub with some friends, whatever it might be, we really don't have the ability, certainly in the UK and so many countries across the world, the ability to do that. So it's kind of nice that we live in these times where we have the technology to get together. Which is a nice segue into my friend and uh, host, let's say, our virtual host at our first distillery. So if we head up over the, uh, the Kintyre 
uh, down the Kintyre Peninsula, down towards uh, Campbelltown, will happen upon this this wee Victorian industrial a port, basically a, an old industrial fishing town. Um, a town that's kind of uh, been built on the idea of railways and coal and a fishing port at the time, hugely benefited from the industrial uh, era during the late 19th century and early 20th century, but then immediately started to hit problems. Um, there was just too many, too much whiskey being produced. Some say that Campbelltown were trying uh, to chase efficiency and trying to, in order to try and uh, make more whiskey rather than better whiskey, the quality dipped. I don't know if that's true or not. Um, it's very difficult for, for people to taste whiskey from that era to testify if it's true or not. It could be that there was some marketing going on, some politics, lots of things happening during competing times as markets tightened. But another couple of things happened uh, to, to put uh, pressure on Campbelltown, and that was obviously the First World War. It was prohibition. And it was also a lot to do with the nearby coal seam, a very rich, rich source of fuel, just completely ran dry and there was no more coal available. It was much more expensive to get coal shipped in instead of just using the dedicated uh, canal that they actually installed in order to put the coal onto barges and bring it straight into the town from the nearby coal seam. And also the, the, the railway fell into disrepair and eventually was dismantled as well. So this ended up giving Campbelltown um, not only kind of so, uh, socioeconomic pressures, but it also meant that it ended up being quite isolated. At one point, there was 30 plus distilleries in Campbelltown. If you go through the, the, if you do some research, you can find the name of more than 30 distillery names. And that was just the ones that were licensed and legal all through the 19th century and into the start of the 20th century. And eventually, at one point in time, every single one of them was closed. Glen Scotia and Springbank has, have been the true survivors over time. And more recently, we've got a phoenix from the flames in Kilcarran. And that's where we're going to head first. We're going to head down to Kilcarran. And I'm going to bring in somebody that you've been asking me to bring in since the last time he was here. You've been asking after him. Uh, he went through a wee patch of uh, not being very well recently. He couldn't join us for the Isla tour as a host at Kalila. Um, he wasn't feeling too well. Uh, we're all suspicious that it may be something to do with the C word. But I can tell you that he's healthy and he's back and fine. <laughs> I've just seen what he's doing on the camera. He's looking healthy, he's sounding healthy, and I want to welcome in my friend, Roddy Graham. Roddy, how are you, my friend? Roddy, I'm well, thank you, yes, I. You all right? Is this, is this you wearing your Kilcarran hat? Um, it's another brand, which shall <laughs> remain nameless. Another brand that shall re remain nameless? Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Looks like a Trilby. Uh, I guess it is, yeah. Um, well, I, think, I think it's quite in fitting with Victorian times. <laughs> it is because Campbelltown is a very Victorian town, right? Yeah, all, all that red sandstone. All the red sandstone, uh, the kind of boom that came up around that time, and whiskey being a huge, huge part of it. The, the names that I read out at the start of the stream, you would have perhaps heard most of those being used to refer to Campbelltown at some point in time, the whiskey Aye. capital of the world, right? But it's changed days now. As I mentioned to you, does it surprise you to hear that the entire region's output, and I'm not going to get into the discussion of is Campbelltown a region with Roddy Graham? Not right now. <laughs> <laughs> but the entire region's output is less than a kind of average to small size distillery of Glengoyne. It's less than a million litres that they're putting out there just now. It's it's quite incredible. I think, um, you know, the... Uh, through the 80s and 90s and the, the earlier part of the 2000s, uh, after the after the crash in the early 80s, I think uh, you know if you talk to people that that, that were involved at, uh, at Springbank at, at Mitchell, uh, J and Mitchell, yeah, there was a, a, a conscious decision to to move away from volume. You know, uh, through the seventies, they they had a lot of contract distilling, um, yes. and they you know they lost that. They were completely, you know, when when the crash came in eighty three, they were they were they were scuppered then. Yeah. 
You know, so they were was closed. That, was that kind of a move for them to kind of take control of their own destiny? You think a bit? Yeah, I think you know, the, you know, the, the, you talk to people that, that work that have worked there for a while, and you know, they're they're almost universally well, they are universally full of praise for Headley Wright, the man uh, who's who, who's run Jerry Mitchell for uh, I don't know how long decades, uh, and you know the way that he's. Rodney, just one second. There's a few people commenting that your audio is a wee bit loud, and I have noticed it. Um, um, how do I, I change that? I've, I don't know if you've any way to, to reduce the gain. Is it just a built-in mic in your laptop? Um, right. How's that? Oh, it's better, but a wee bit too quiet now. Uh, let's, uh, let's let me well, let me set my volume so. Right. You can... How about that then? Oh, that's that's much better. Right. That's kind <laughs> in the middle of the scale then. Right. Is that all right, I middle or just below middle, I think is good. Right. Yeah, Everybody I mean, that, saying your guest is Roddy is much louder than you, so I think we're good now. That's better. Right. Okay. Cool. It's much clearer as well, much less distortion. Superb. Right. Okay. So sorry about that, Roy. Uh, no, that's okay. It's, uh, uh, thanks to everybody for feeding back to say everybody's saying much better. Oliver, thank you. Stevie is saying much better. Better, better, perfect. Better, much right. better. We're good. Everybody's good, happy good, now. Good. Uh, I was a wee bit worried that it was maybe bandwidth or something happening at my side, so it's good that that we looked in. Fantastic. Sorry, you were saying yes, Headley Wright, very respected. Aye, um, and I think, you know, as somebody who clearly uh, was taking the long view on things, uh, you know, saw that the, the, the way to go, and, you know, perhaps saw uh, ahead of other people that single malt was, was, was the way to go. Um, I mean, you mentioned the the Campbellton Loch earlier. Yes. You know the the uh, the, the Mitchells blend. Uh, blend yeah. Which which uh, is a nice wee dram, but you know it's not like they really push it at all. You know, you yeah. you need to sort of hunt for it to find it. Yes. Uh, I mean, I, not... I remember seeing it, and I as I was mentioning Campbellton Loch as a blend, it suddenly struck me mid sentence that I've not seen it in a long time. Aye, and, aye. And I suddenly doubted myself, maybe, but I can't imagine they would finish it. Um, Campbellton no, Loch, for anybody that's I think it still not, exists. Sorry? Yeah, I think it still exists, but just the, it's not important to them, you know? The, well, it's, it's probably marketed like everything from Springbank, everything from, from those guys. It's like just, it's almost stealth marketing. It's anti-marketing, right? You know, the, the, the demand builds for itself without them doing anything, it seems. Yeah, it's um, reverse marketing, you know? Yeah. And Campbellton Lock, for anybody that's watching, as well as it being that blend that Roddy's mentioned there, Campbellton Lock is a, a a saltwater loch. It's kind of a harbour, a very sheltered inland harbour pointing into the peninsula, which meant that um, you know the climate was kind of kind, the sea was kind. It was it was a, a fantastic natural harbour, which helped, I guess, the settlement would have been originally around that harbour for fishing originally, I would imagine. Uh, I, I don't know the early history of, of Campbelltown, but um, certainly they all talk about the natural harbour. You weren't uh, interested until they started distilling. Yeah, no, it's like nothing, <laughs> nothing before uh, 1828. <laughs> uh -huh. But it is interesting that, um, and it, it, we talk about that, I, I read a really, really funny thing kind of reading up to this VPUB tonight that it was widely, because they were so remote, they were almost isolated down there. Uh, illicit distilling was everywhere, but nobody cared. And there were very, very few fines given out in that region for illicit distilling. In fact, the coppersmith in town making and repairing the stills for Aye. everyone was doing it in open. He was recording everything. And there was no, there were simply no fines dished out because of where uh -huh. they were. Um, and then suddenly the 1823 Act passes, licenses are available to legally distill and legally make money out of your craft. And instantly, within the space of two or three years, there are 27 distilleries like that open up in Springbank, uh, sorry, in, in Campbelltown. <laughs> and it just kind of builds on the back of that. Um, and it's kind of that serendipitous thing. Because there was an industrial uh, a settlement building there, because of that harbour, because of the location on the back of illegal distilling, that's how that cradle of whiskey making was originally born, I guess. Mm -hmm. Aye. Yeah. I think uh, you know the uh, it's kind of a it 
something that the it's, I think it's maybe it's too boring for a, a brand story, but it's interesting how the eighteen twenty three uh, saw this huge uh, explosion of people who were happy to pay the um, the license and be yeah. tax paying citizens, but in in another sense, you know the what was the, the first tax on whiskey was. 1644 or something like that. Uh-huh. So, you know, in one sense, it took the, the Scottish slash British government nearly two centuries to figure out the correct tax to levy on on whiskey. Uh-huh. You know, one so, where people would actually want to step up and be legal. Aye, 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 aye. Yeah. You know, they, they, they had endless iterations of taxes that people couldn't be bothered to pay. Yeah. Or, you know, they made the calculation that it was... It was, you know, the, the the risk of fines was was going to be cheaper than just paying for the license. Absolutely, absolutely. Simon Ray says that Campbellton Lock appears to be sold out on the interweb. Ah. I know that Roddy will go into the Good Spirits Company in Glasgow tomorrow and check his own shop. They, I know that we don't have any. Uh, it's not. it's not something that we 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 stock very often. We don't just don't get offered it very often. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and you know, blends isn't a big part of what we do anyway. So, sure, absolutely. Um, what you're doing tonight is uh, working at Colcairn, apparently. <laughs> now, what? I think you mentioned Headley Wright. Headley Wright is obviously the, the guy that's in charge of uh, Janie Mitchell right now. So he's in charge uh-huh. of Spring Bank. And he's in charge of Glen Gale, which make Kilcarran. Um Colcairn is the brand, sorry, and Glen Gale is the distillery. Uh, but he is the great, great grandson of James Mitchell, and James yeah, Mitchell, so the, James Mitchell is responsible for founding Glengyle Distillery in the in the early nineteenth century, I think. Uh huh. Uh huh. Although I I I don't think uh, I don't think it's a sentimental thing that that uh, moved Janie Mitchell to bring back. Glengyle Distillery. Uh, I think Glengyle Distillery was uh, had some investment in the thirties before it closed. Um, so I think it was it just it happened to be extremely well preserved distillery. You know when when Mitchells were looking for a, a way to expand at the end of the nineties. Yes. Um, Glengyle was the obvious choice because because in it was terms in terms of the Australia. buildings and and those yeah. kind of things. Yeah. 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 Uh-huh. Um, the, I mean, they, they they like to tell some sentimental stories about about Glengyle and 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 so on. But I think I suspect it was a a strictly hard headed business decision. Yes. Yes. Uh, That's interesting. I mean, that, that is interesting, and I, I suppose it's just nice then that they can because. After it closed down in the early 20th century, I think it became originally a petrol station, then it was a gun club or something, and then it was an agricultural sh- dealer or and somebody dealing in agricultural equipment. And by the time that they took those buildings over, there was a hell of a lot of work needed done, and there was no distillery equipment left mm-hmm, remaining, mm-hmm. correct? Sorry, uh, Scotch Test Dummies, uh, uh, Scott and uh, Bart, Scotch Test Dummies over in Kansas. Cheers and good to see Roddy. Thank you so much, boys. Yes. Thank you for your for your uh, virtual dram. It's good to yes. see you too, Scott. I don't know if you can see Roy. Uh, I'm I'm prop. It's I'm branded on the glass. Can yes, see I, I see it. Thank you so much. <laughs> By the way, Phil and Deepa were using my glasses tonight as well, but on their live stream before this one, I didn't ask anybody to do this. I'm, I've not asked Roddy to do that. I'm just very grateful that he did. The, um, but while you hold up your glass with that very dark liquid that's in it, I think it's time for my first uncorking. And it has to be well, uh, Karen. Let's uh, try and do this simultaneously then, because uh, I am also uncorking this bottle. And I have here to share, and this is out of absolutely pure coincidence, this is not synchronised at all, I have the Warrior Pack from the Scotch Test Dummies, <laughs> so I have I have here the the what do you call this? The, the what is this called now? The Spartan helmet. This one here. Oh yes. I... You can see, but you can see it's got a Glen Cairn for a nose. <laughs> you see that? 
and this is their Android helmet. This is the helmet, sorry, or mask. They call this future dummy. So I'm going to use yeah, the, the Android one for this. And I'm I'm opening here, and it, the, everybody's going to go nuts over this. Are you in, are you opening one as well? Yes, I am. I... Do you know how hard this is to come by now? Because everybody's banging on about it. I'm going to be controversial here, Roddy, and I'm going to say this is a terrible Kulkeran. What? This is an amazing one. <laughs> Absolutely amazing. But I don't know how much of a representation of Kulkeran it is. If you if you compare it to, let's say, the, the, the previous eight-year-old back strength, certainly, or cast strengths, and comparing it also to the 12-year-old. Well, funnily enough, uh, I've got last year's eight-year-old as well. One moment, coming back. Um, so I'll get to I'll get to uncork this. This is my uh, second bottle, and this came to me through um, through the community. Uh, I, I tore through the previous mm. bottle very very quick. It will appear in a recycled review soon, um, but this one came to me from uh, my friend uh, Glenn up in the Highlands. This is the late 2019 release of Kulkeran, eight-year-old cast strength. Right, so this is the uh, 2018 release, which is... Uh, uh, what ABV is that then? 56.5. Uh, 56.2, so it's a slightly different release, this one. But it's so that's good, the color, right? 2017 release, maybe? Perhaps. But I have to say that um, I, on the lockdown festival, um, Ranald from Kilkerran was on, and I gave him a hard time over his labelling. Springbank are famously lazy. You know, they, they put on their... This is the exact same label as this one, and look at the difference. I know, I know, I know. The only thing that's different is the ABV, and it's the same for Spring Bank cast strength releases as well, that literally the only way you can track the, the releases is the ABV. But if you look... Uh, there might be a bottle code on it somewhere, but this one's too dark to actually read any any bottle codes anyway. I can't... I can't well, you're looking for a little kind of inked code or something? Yeah, on aye, the dot matrix thing that gets printed yeah. on it. No, I can't see anything on this one, but I mean... But yeah, talk us through this, Roddy. I mean, every man and his dog on the internet, everybody in Whiskey Tube has, has shared an opinion on this eight-year-old product. It's uh, it blew the doors off. It really did. It did, aye, aye. aye. Um, I, I've not heard anybody say anything negative about it. I'm just I'm um, so I'm taking the the previous year's release as a kind of a less cask influenced example of Kilkerran. Exactly. Um, yes. Aye. Because I, I think I know where you're going, Roy, when you're saying that, that you don't think it's a great example of Kilkerran because of, the, because, because of the cask influence. But you see, the thing is that I would say that um, it's precisely because of the spirit character of Kilkerran and the way that it interacts with that strong sherry character that makes this such a, a great dram and which is the, it's the reason why so many people get excited by it. Um, you know, so the... If you're looking at the the le the 2018, so the less woody, the less, the more spirit driven whiskey, you can see that there's that grassy character right. that that you mentioned when you were talking about Campbelltown, and you can you can still get that in the uh, the 2019, that grassiness. It's it's just it's. It, you know, I, think like the, I think the fruit and the big dark red sugars and the boldness is fighting. Well, yeah, the, the, it's 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 not a it's not a calm whiskey. You know, it's not a it's not a no. composed elegant whiskey. You know, it's a big shouty whiskey. If you whiskey. drink this dram in company, this is going to be just as loud as the people speaking, right? And every <laughs> sip is going to be asking for your attention. Uh huh. Uh huh. Cheers. Hmm. See, I was gonna, I was gonna say that I. It's like the as if the sherry cask is. It's like the difference between fresh hay and and silage. 
you know you know that's uh -huh, that's, and that, that seems it, they would put a lot of people off i, I know i know i know you're talking about um you can't talk too much about those notes and um, unless people that ends up being the only thing that people might be able to taste so you have to kind of talk about the other things and then suggest that there might be um a greener note in there but 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 once you pick that up and it's that's not just coquerin right I, I don't know if you feel the same way as i do but that's right throughout campbelltown even in glen scotia that that, that, yeah. that note's present uh-huh uh -huh. um i mean it, it's kind of you, you know we make these comparisons because because we we perceive them but but it, it's to do with context you know if you think about you know parmesan cheese you know if if Feet, yeah, like it's, Parmesan's delicious. Yes. You know, and, <laughs> but if you get a bit of Parmesan and say to somebody, sweaty feet, they have to agree with you. Yes. Because that, it, it, that's what it is, and it, it's context. So when you say that, you know, whether it's the 2018 um, or the 2019, they both have a kind of slightly fermented grassy thing. So, you know, silage is the word for it, you know. The, I think the... The 2018 one's kind of sweeter, lighter. You see, it's more clearly a, a Kilkerran, whereas this is just a big, bold, shouty yeah, Campbell. I believe, I believe the, the 2018 one, or the one that, you, that you've mentioned there, the lighter one, there's still sherry cask in that, but it's perhaps a 70-30 or a yeah. it's all urban or... It's the, you know, it's not, it's not a big whacking layer of, sherry on top of the spirit it's whereas this is exclusive now what's interesting is the doc has just chimed in and said that he found a printed code uh, that says eight years and it has a code on it it is it's hard to see certainly against the color of the liquid if, oh there is a code right down on the bottom there oh yeah right. it does, I see it says eight years cocaine I'm going to struggle to make that out. I would have to use a better light and a magnifier, but there it is an inked code on there. It Trust says, mine says, mine says 17th of October, 2019. And then uh, a lot number. Okay. So it just, I hope I'm not making everybody seasick, by the way, with just swooshing backwards and forwards. But uh, Are you in a rocking chair? I'm not in a rocking chair, but I'm, I'm in a very comfy chair, so, you know. There's a few yeah. people asking about your health, Roddy. Let's fill them in and just tell them that you're fit and fighting again. Yes. I am. Thank you. Yes, that's that's very kind. Uh, I was I was near wheel. Um, I've not been tested, so who knows, but I certainly had a load of the symptoms to do with the, the, the C word. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> I was flat on my back for five days. Uh, um, and then I had another uh, five days of, of just kind of recuperating and, uh, you know, spending far too long staring at the news. Um, Stir crazy cabin fever had kicked in by that time, though. Yeah, You're back at work now, though, right? I am, yes. I we're we're, um, we're pretty busy, actually. We're, we're, um, the shops, two of the shops are closed, Um our West End shop is still open, but the other two shops were just doing mail order. But that's obviously suits a lot of people. So, you know, we're doing Absolutely. a lot of uh, deliveries. Absolutely. I used it. I also got um, Alex cycled my delivery out here. Um, <laughs> my, my, I'm starting to echo through a wee bit. Could you dial down your speakers just a wee touch as well? Aye. Um, as long as you can still hear me, though, right? Um, uh, Alex. Alex uh, cycled and delivered. He had a little satchel on and he was kind of dressed in cycling clothes. And I thought, there's no way he's cycled out. I'm about, I don't know how many miles I am, maybe four or five miles out from the centre I am. Um, and he said, no, no, I cycled out. <laughs> so I got a Good Spirits Company delivery service to the home. Um, and it's uh, one that I'm actually potentially going to be uncorking tonight. It was a long row red that he brought out to me. Aye. Uh, and a King's Barnes, yeah. Yeah. Alex, uh, he's got a fixie as well. You know, he's he's the the proper bicycle courier. You know, uh, yeah. the, you know the the fixed gear on the yes. Uh, so he's using the pedal brake with a fixed gear, right? Aye, that's right. Yeah, that's aye, right. Aye. 
Yeah. I, I always struggle with those. Augustine is saying 100% bourbon in all previous Coquerin 8 releases. Right. I, I don't know. Um, mm. Certainly, the previous ones don't taste sherryish. Yeah. Um, yeah. Unlike this monster. Yeah. I mean, that is, I mean, it's, you, you're absolutely spot on. It's very cask forward. This is bold, and there's no way, even, even if you had this from a dark glass, you would taste this in no sherry cask, right? You'd, it's, it's jumping out the glass. But you make a great point that the spirit is is loud enough, certainly still at eight years old, to make its voice known. Uh -huh. And everything that we come to enjoy, the character that we, we come to enjoy at Campbellton Whiskies is still in this. I, th I think uh, it's, you know, it, it's not a sophisticated drum. Uh, you know, it's not a subtle drum, but uh, that combination of the the... the the Campbelltown funk, or you know, the that sort of fermented note with the, yes. the very bold cherry cast, just it works. You know, it's it like does. the way that um, you know the, the 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 you know if you if you take something like the Lagavulin Distillers Edition, you know that that combination of of a uh, uh, the kind of heavy oily. Spicy peatiness with sherry casks, you know, it's an absolutely wonderful combination. I have yeah. to say, and I, I know I don't know if you feel the same way, but often with a very, very rich sherry cask expression, let's take a very rich Glendronach or a, or a Space Cider perhaps or something like that, they can be wonderful and they can be really luscious and quite a decadent experience sometimes. Uh -huh. But I'm often feeling like after I've had a nice dram, I'm not reaching for a second one. You know, they can be quite full-on rich experiences that you know you're maybe looking to go somewhere else or maybe that's enough this i, I find yeah. is moorish i find this to be moorish ah right okay right right and i, See, don't I was know, gonna because of the vibrance and the, the grip and the kind of texture and the spice that this is kind of it, it kind of makes you want to go back again and go back which is why uh -huh. i finished the last bottle so quickly in fact there it is there there's a wee trickle left in it and why uh, is that in it? Because that's going to be in a recycled review, and I need to leave the last ram for a, uh, for a yeah. giveaway, right? Um, the so um, I corked another one. Yeah, I mean, I, I was I was going to make the point that those big whiskies that you only want one off, that can be a good thing because a big sherry monster is usually expensive. So if you only have one, then it lasts longer. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yep. But you kind of get yeah. what I'm talking about there. That. It's just so rich, it's so luscious that you've kind of, you're just sitting, and it's still on your teeth, it's on your palate, you're walking around for ages, you you don't feel, but this is kind of very, there's a there's a nice dryness to it, the spice, the texture, the, the way it sits on the palate. I mean, we don't know, I don't suppose we know whether this is American oak or European oak. To me, it strikes me as a wee bit more American oak, so it's less that kind of dry, kind of uh, tannic thing that European oak maybe brings. This, mm. is, a, this is a kind of sweeter, richer, caramel air if there's such a word and um, right. that's how it that's how it's playing to me but the spirit is still at eight years old um very vocal yes right mm -hmm. the no these these are you, you would hope they'd be american oak because the the sherry makers do say that that's what they prefer that you know it's good sherry casks you know, yes. the, the selection of casks has been has been very careful for this Yes, absolutely. And what was the outturn? Do you know about nine, ten thousand, or a bit more? Or? Uh, I can't remember, Roy. Really. Okay, uh, okay. I mean, certainly there is. There's going to be people that's still able to pick this up, but in the UK, you're going to be odds and ends here and there. I think it's gone in most places now. Um, uh, we ours was gone uh, within a week, I think. Yeah, yeah. In fact, that bottle that's emptied it was the last bottle in your shop. Was it right? Yeah. Aye. Aye. Um, so yeah. I'm very, very grateful that I managed to get a hold of it, and I'm very, very grateful to to uh, Dancing Midgey Glenn for for this bottle as well. He's a super. Yeah, well, I'm very glad I've opened this tonight because it's. Uh, I tasted this um, two or three times towards the end of last year. Um, t you know, talking to the guys from uh, Glen Gyle at various shows, so I knew it was an, an absolute cracker. Uh, so I grabbed the bottle when it came in. Uh, and just needed an excuse to open it. So, superb, superb. I tell you what. Depending on your perspective, this is um, this is 
it's certainly a product of uh, this uh, social distancing, this isolating thing, because you would normally be sat next to me and we would only need to open one. <laughs> so depending on your perspective, no, it's good to have them both open or, oh, it would be nice to keep one sealed, you know. Um, ah, well, yeah. I mean, you know, whiskey's for drinking. Uh, Absolutely. I, I think, uh, I would, I don't know about you, Roy, but I would say that one side effect of, of, of this current a unmentionable situation is that I'm I'm looking at various bottles that I've sat on my shelves a while and I'm I'm much I'm feeling much more disposed to open them than I would have been uh, if this if all of this hadn't happened, you know. That's interesting. Is that because you've been in the house with cabin fever or is that you making a deeper connection with your mortality? What is <laughs> what do you think it is? I would, I would you know, I would say it's like, you know, you buy a bottle and you think, I'll save that for a, a special occasion, you know. And then, as we all do, you end up with with dozens of bottles that you're saving for a special occasion. And then something like this happens and you think, well, you know, I'm fine. But, you know, suppose I hadn't been. Or the Aye. bottles would be just... That's right. Just, you know? And, and going to somebody else, well, that's just not going to do, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, well, Daniel Whiskey the, Throttle, before he bought me a virtual dram, he'd made a comment a wee bit earlier up. You'd been spotted by Daniel as one half of the Whiskey Woman. But Daniel hi. also w um, met you when he was, you helped Daniel out with some packaging and air sacs before he made a trip back to Canada. Oh, yes, right. Hi, and hi. so he's, he's he's really pleased to see you. he's bought a virtual dram. He said, my buddy woman, it was awesome meeting him on my last day in Glasgow, sold me some great whiskeys. Slanche Daniel, yeah. it's Daniel over in Canada. Slanche, my Here's friend. Daniel. Slanche. So I have to say, if we were to summarise Coquer and Roddy, uh, I know that you'll be able to do it better than me. I gave it producer of the year last year. I was already very, very happy with the content that was coming out. I enjoyed a lovely 15-year-old single cask, um, ex-bourbon single cask, a be beautiful whiskey. I love the 12-year-old. It's, it's easily my favourite 12-year-old right now. I, I get through a lot of it. Um, I've got another bottle here in case we were going to use it tonight. Um, oh no, that's the eight-year-old, sorry. The 12-year-old is here, still in this tube. Um, I gave it my producer of the year, and then they brought out that heavily peated, the peat in progress. Aye, aye, aye. Three or four-year-old whiskey, just a beautiful peated whiskey. And so unique for a peated whiskey, I have to say. It's not competing with Isla whiskeys. It's doing its own thing. It's carving its own furrow in a peated style. Mm. Wonderful. And at the same festival, I then hold this up. It, wasn't, it was in a clear, there was no labels on the bottle hadn't yeah. been released. It was the Alhambra Festival in Stirling last year. And it was Grant. And Grant says, yeah. oh, you need, if you like that, you need to try this. And I didn't believe him. It was Kilkerran. <laughs> I genuinely didn't believe him because you look at it and you think, eight years old. And I mean, just such a, you know, and once you sip this, it's like, where are you going to go at a festival? Where can you go from, from this? You're just going back yeah. to that stand again and saying, can I have another one of those, please? Yes, indeed. Aye. Amazing, amazing whiskey. And what the reason that it got producer of the, the year for me were those great whiskies. But this was less than £60, right? Mm -hmm. I know it's, it's a fantastic whiskey. Um, I think what I like about Kilkerran um, is actually, we're not drinking it tonight, but the 12-year-old, you know, it's it's that it's 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 such a such a quaffable dram, and the yep. price is is still so good, um, uh, and but but it's it's perhaps a little bit more approachable, because it's lighter than than say Springbank ten year old, um, you know it's perhaps a little bit softer as well. So. Well, uh, that's that's interesting because we were at a, we were at another festival and it was Willie Dolier who's probably in tonight and Craig Dolier was were with me. And the last one of the last stands of the day was the Kilkerran stand. I think it was Grant again, and uh, you know those guys had n they'd never tried a Kilkerran before. And I said, just try the twelve year old. It's beautiful, and they felt it was very quiet and subtle, and they were they were tasting it and they're going, we don't. It's nice whiskey, but we don't really get what you're talking about. And I realised that at a festival, when you've been round and saturated yourself right. with everything else on offer, when you talk, when you spoke earlier about this not being subtle, the twelve-year-old, um, it it could be subtler, honestly, but it's a subtle whiskey. And the more time that you spend with it, 
the more you get out of it. And it's easy to do that because you hit the nail right on the head. Quaffable is exactly a great mm -hmm. way to. Um, and it, I, you know, it is, you know, the, it's, it's the same malt that, that's used at Springbank, but the stills are bigger and it's a more straightforward process. So you yeah. get, you get this, this lighter style of whiskey. And I think the, a lot of the time we're all guilty of, uh, you know, it's the loud shouty whiskeys that, you know, what, what in, in wine terms, what's called a, a show wine or a show whiskey. Yeah, you know the one that the one that grabs your attention, that grabs you by the throat and won't let go. Yeah, and there's a there's a bunch of drams that that just don't do that. You know they're they're tucked into themselves and they 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 insist that if you want to appreciate them, you need to get a, a, a wee bit of peace and quiet. And you need you know, to invest. You need to invest in the whiskey in order for it to give up its treasures. That's aye aye aye, and the uh, you know the it's the kind of drams that don't do well at the whiskey club. You know, yeah. You know th things like Glenburgie, for example. I think is a good example of a distillery. Glenburgie, maybe Longmorn. Um, aye, aye, aye. Uh, maybe um, I remember the night, and I wasn't. You know, I love Campbelltown whiskies. I really do, but I think they've got a place and a mood associated with them. I'm not the oh. type that would just drink them all the time, all the time. I just I need contrast. I need always to be contrasting them. And there was a night, you'll remember this night at the Whiskey Club when I recall this story, but there's a joke at the Whiskey Club in Glasgow of which uh, Roddy is chairman, I think. You're chairman? Uh, secretary. Secretary, I'm sorry. Julie's the chair. Julie's the chair. Julie's the chair. Sorry, Julie. And now she's going to batter you. Aye, she will batter me. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm in for it for a doing. So at the Whiskey Club, if there's a Campbellton whiskey there, chances are it's going to win drama of the night. If it's a Springbank, pretty much guaranteed it's going to be drama of the night. Yeah, that's yeah. pretty much an unwritten rule. The night that there's now there's been a couple of nights with Springbank's been in the lineup and had not been, uh, which I think is healthy. That, that mm -hmm. um, but the very first time I remember that happening was it was one of my favourite Springbanks, the fourteen year old Bourbonwood. Right. Do you remember that release with the blue label? Right, it was right. beat, it was beaten out by a bomb, a literal sherry bomb from Glenrothes, a single cask. Oh but yes, sixty-six point eight percent ABV. Yes. Uh, as dark as this, dark as Coca-Cola. Um, and that took drama of the night, and and, and the Springbank fourteen Bourbonwood was second. Now, I loved both those whiskies. I loved them both, but I remember that fourteen-year-old Bourbonwood being one of the most enjoyable Springbanks I'd had up until that stage, um, because it was just a different thing all the springbank thing was intact here but that lovely sweet malty honey yes um so it was uh that was a kind of uh, a, an end thing from the glasgow whiskey club that uh, there are a lot of springbank fans there there are a lot of campbelltown fans there um, i'd put my hand my, i'd include myself in that uh, absolutely category. absolutely um, I'm thinking of Sean and Rich, and I'm thinking Aye. of Scott and and those guys, and and they have been around and drank all the whiskies that Scotland has to offer and beyond, and their comfort, their nice place to go is very much Campbelltown whiskies. Yes, Aye. I think it's nice when you step out and you get contrasts, and then you go back and you enjoy those other styles of whiskies, whether it's peated mm -hmm. or Campbelltown or whatever it is. Um, and I love when the subtler whiskies speak to you because it also is really flattering to you. You feel like you're making progress. And something <laughs> that was utterly quiet to you, suddenly uh -huh. you're you're uncovering richness and layers, and that's that's addictive. And I mean a, a addictive in an experiential way rather than an ABV way. It's uh, I, I, maybe that's the point you were thinking about when you were talking about your Glen Burgies and your. Yeah, I, I think so. You know, um, my whiskey journey um, was I. You know, I I started at the you know the the thunder end of the scale. You know, like for a long time, the only whiskey I would drink was was Lafroig, uh, ten year old cast strength. Yes, because because it was you didn't need to work to understand it. You <laughs> don't. You know, it's it just it does all the work for you. You know. And then but, uh, but when you're when you're bringing people into whiskey, and you must find this at the shop when you're doing tastings, 
when when new folk come into whiskey, it's not the light, delicate things that get them. It's the big hooks, whether it's sherry, really sweet bourbon, heavily peated. It, it has to be a hook, something yeah. that they can connect with. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, f f further along the road, uh, I was introduced to a Lagavulin Distillers Edition that I've already mentioned. Um, and, you know, it's still a big whiskey, but it's more subtle because it's got that complex interaction between the, the different cask types, you know? Yeah. And then eventually I ended up on, it, it was, do you know... Um, Give us Robertson's context here. What, what, what year would we be speaking about? Uh, this would be about 15 years ago. Okay. The mid 2000s. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, 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 like all, th you know, I didn't start drinking whiskey till about 1990 or thereabouts. And for the, you know, all through that period, it was just Lafroy cask strength, which you could readily get in those days. <laughs> in Scotland, it's distillery only now. Aye, the, it was just, I guess it was core range in those days. Um, um, and then sort of kind of um, the mid from the mid 2000s, uh, at that point I was working with um, Andy Bell, in, in variety Andy Bell. Yes. Who's, other, a, who's an earlier Andy Bell. Yeah. yeah, not yeah. one of the many whiskey Andy Bells. Yeah. And that Andy's an Iliac and a huge whiskey enthusiast and a very, very generous chap. He he, uh, he was always bringing stuff in for, for us to taste. Um, and uh, it, was him, it was him, I think, that put me on to Glen Burgie as being, you know, another style of whiskey again. Um, and I then discovered that Robertson's of Pitlochry, they were also Glen Burgie fans, so they always had the the, the Gordon McPhail 10 year old, um, and they always had it at a good price. And that kind well, of that was that's it. very interesting for you to bring that whiskey up because that's a whiskey you switched me on to, aye. Uh -huh. And because we were talking about this very thing about ABV and trying to find that kind of lighter, more kind of bourbon cask style of whiskey. 40% ABV, but something that has something to keep us engaged when we're happy. Um, and you said, have you tried the Glen Burgie? And I'd seen it everywhere. It was When you recommended it to me three, four years ago, that was available everywhere. But now that 10-year-old GM license bottling of Glen Burgie is, I think, discontinued. It has, yeah. They've discontinued it, sadly. They've um, GM sort of rationalised the range or, well, you know, I would say over-rationalised. They got rid of too many things. Um, so maybe it will come back, you know, when stocks are better. But the, just to sort of kind of come back to Kilkerran, Roy, yep. um, the, I, I, I do think that the, the, the Kilkerran 12-year-old, it's got that, that subtlety of character that, you, you know, it, it's definitely... It's soft enough that it's approachable for somebody that wants a, a an everyday drum. But you know, if you if you if you give it a bit of time, you know, if you sit down with it, there's there's depths to it. You know, absolutely, that. absolutely. And again, it's less than forty pounds. Um, it's it's the type of thing that you. It's widely available. I mean, even when we all talk about not being able to get our hands on. Uh, Campbelltown releases, Springbank releases, that kind of thing. You can usually get your hands on a Kilkerran 12, right? Mm. There is enough of it out there. I, I recommend that all the time. My friend, the Whiskey Rev is in. Good to see you, my friend. Good to welcome you in. Um, and he's talking about Robertson's at Pitlocker. His own bottlings being superb whiskies at great prices. Mm. Alistair Gray is here saying over 300 people. Fantastic. Um, I'm going to try and interact with the chat a wee bit. Um, I'm going to... Um, but just before we finish up, Roddy, uh, I'm going to welcome you back a wee bit later, I hope, tonight. Um, but before we finish up at Glen, uh, sorry, at Kilker and at Glen Gyle and move on to our next distillery there in Campbelltown, how would you summarise Kilker? And for me, it's a bit of a celebration, a renaissance, a, a kind of phoenix from the flames. Um, it's a really nice thing for that to be back. But I think what's compelling about it is for it to be back and instantly one of the the, the go-to whiskies. It's quite an amazing thing for me. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you well, would summarize. As, as our host at Kilkerran tonight. <laughs> I, I, I think um, 
the Kilkerran's um, a bit like a swan or something, you know. It's it, it's sort of it's a it's a, 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 a I think a nicely packaged whiskey, and it's you know it's got a bit of elegance to it. But th- th- there's a lot of stuff has been going on at Glengyle that we don't really see. You know, they did all kinds of weird experimental um, distillations. They filled spirit into casks, which means that it, it can never be called whiskey. Um, yes. And What's the, the, yeah. they, 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 they don't talk about those things. You know, they're, they, they, you know, they were clearly doing a lot of stuff to, to figure out how to make a good whiskey. And the, the, the things that didn't work, they've just quietly tucked out the way, you know. And I'm, I'm sure that uh, maybe further down the lines we'll see some really weird stuff from Kilkerran, but I, I think the, the great thing about it is that, and it, it's, it's it's coming back to what I was saying about uh, Mitchell's having, you know, thinking about the long game. You know, they, they started work on Kilkerran in uh, 2000, on Glengyle, sorry, in 2000. It took them four years, more or less, to get it to the point of production. Yes. And, and they were happy to wait another 12 years before they actually... I mean, I, I know there was the, the work, work in progress, progress series, but none of them were none of them were in big quantities. You know, that yes. was really just to, to remind people that, that they were that they were working. Yeah. So, they were, you know, they were happy to wait the 12 years before they, they launched their whiskey. Yeah. And that's admirable. Yeah, and the only other one that springs to mind is Daphmill that's been able to do that, right? Aye. Yeah, and look at what's happening there as well. Fantastic. Listen, my friend, I hope you're going to hang around a wee bit uh, longer with us as we uh, we go and explore the rest of Campbelltown. Um, I'll say thank you very much for welcoming us at Kink- Kilkerran tonight. Roddy Graham, it's great to see you in such fine health, and uh, I hope to welcome you back very soon. Cheers, Roy. Slanchy, my friend. Slanchy, my <laughs> Roddy Graham, looking and sounding, eventually sounding well, very healthy. It's great to see him. And uh, before Roddy appeared on the show back in December with me, uh, lots of people heard me talking about Roddy. And Roddy used to get a wee bit annoyed with me because I used to say to him, he used to tell him, look, I like, I love sitting next to you. I just feel like I can, um," because it's not just the fact that he's very, very knowledgeable. It's often the context that he gives to his insights and his perspective as well. I just find it very, very interesting to sit with Roddy. Um, And I hope you pick up some of that over uh, this kind of uh, uh, virtual medium. Um, Daniel Vermas is giving him a thumbs up and saying Roddy is a superstar. Pete Head is saying, thanks, Roddy. Oliver Trovavis is saying Roddy is the best. I have to say, I enjoy hanging out with him as well. Thomas Elmer is saying, not bad. One guest down, three to go, and just under an hour for the introduction. (laughs) It's going to run late tonight. If you care about that, if you think it's a problem, you just just cut it and go to bed. Don't worry. <laughs> um, and then pick it up in chunks. Pick it up tomorrow. Pick it up the weekend. Or or just I'll try and be good at my housekeeping tonight. And after we finish, um, I'll try and go in or first thing in the morning. It never renders. It never allows me to do the timestamps immediately after. I always have to wait for YouTube to process and render. So tomorrow morning I'll do the timestamps. If you're watching this on the replay, look in the description box below and you can click ahead to the next part. I'm going to go in and talk to the barflies in the lounge for a minute and uh, say uh, hello to Thomas McCrory. Good to see you. And my friend Tom Goosens is saying, I missed his slanket. You've put this this slanket thing, it's, it's going to be, I'm never ever going to be able to. One day you may tune in and find Roddy and Roy in a slanket, but it'll have to be the middle of the winter and we'll have to be doing it someplace that's appropriate because it's about 25 degrees in this room right now with the lights and the machines running. Che Francis is saying, hey, did anyone expect anything else? Thank you so much, Che. <laughs> Stevie is saying, how often does it not go late? Uh, Sundays is, have been going okay recently, Steve. Uh, the Whiskey Friend is saying, any chance of the Whiskey Woman coming back? We can ask Roddy about that if he hangs about. Um, a wee bit later. Matthew Parts is saying, not worried about the late V-Pub. Whiskey and Friends are worth it. I agree, Matthew. Absolutely. Scogsmard is saying, Aquavitae, is the plant still moving? Better start watching that lamp again. The lamp and the plant, they're nothing to do with each other. And that, the tour of Isla, we had an explosion in here. It's hilarious to see. Everybody had a good laugh at me hitting the ground practically when this thing exploded behind me and it turned out to be a lamp. 
the plant was moving that night and it's moving tonight, but I guarantee it's because I've got an oscillating fan up there just to try and keep me a wee bit cooler. Uh, Jimmy like is saying I'll stay Scog Smart. Uh, the quiz tonight is going to be uh, it's going to be an easy quiz tonight, everybody. Um, and some of the questions have been uh, sent in by Scog Smart. Scog Smart is a ten out of ten. He managed to uh, earn a ten out of ten. So the, one of the privileges is that he can, if he chooses to, if he wants to, he can contribute questions. And some of the questions that I'm using tonight in the quiz will be Scog Smart's questions. Um, but that will be as we close out tonight, uh, uh, quite a bit later on. Jimmy Legacy, and I'll stay here with you until I'm out of whiskey, Aquaviti. That will be a long time. Thank you, Jimmy. So I, I'm looking forward to the time that you actually go over here, and or perhaps I go over to where you are. I think you're in Canada, Blair, aren't you? Um, it'd be nice to raise a glass in real life. It's going to be so nice to get back to that ability to do that with everyone, all the events that's had to be cancelled. This was going to be an amazing year for the Barflies and, and the community in general, getting chances to meet up in real life. But we've not cancelled it. We've just had to postpone it for a little while. Tim is in Donner Pass Whiskey is saying, um, Aquavita is so glad to be here on a day off, having my first dram of Bunahav and Monual are also amazing. That is an amazing dram, a cracker of a dram to sip along. Nice to have you, Tim. Uh, Bill Dull is saying, I would like Roddy to talk about Scotch cocktails like what Campbelltown uh, makes his favourite Rob Roy. <laughs> Obviously, that's a reference to the last time that Roddy was on. Absolutely. Sunday Evening Scotch Michael is here. You talked me into pouring a small dram of the eight cast strength sherry, and I'm so very angry. And, and he's winking at me. I hope you're enjoying it, Michael. It's an absolute peach. Lee J. Brown is saying, really enjoying. Thank you. Fantastic. Everyone is saying, is that a marijuana plant, Roy? If it is, it's a plastic one, Everyone, There's no light in this room. Certainly not the light to keep a plant like that healthy. It's plastic. It's only there. Is a prop. It's nothing more. But I've had it a long time now, and I have grown quite attached to it. It's appeared in a lot of a lot of Aquavite content over the years. Zen Buddha is saying the light in your Kokerin Bay dimmed about half an hour ago. I hope another capacitor isn't going to pop. I did replace that light, so you can see. Uh, there we. Oh no, that's the other side. Both sides are lit again, so it has been replaced. But it's been replaced by the exact same light, so we might get another thing happening again. Ben Marnock is saying, eh, strange nobody has built a fourth distiller in Campbellton. Surely a no-brainer to be a success and lots of sites to choose from, perhaps. But, I mean, it's it, there's no guarantee that it's going to be a success just because of the location. Eh, it be interesting um, to kind of talk about that, to explore that a wee bit and work out how much of that location is to do with the character of the whiskey and not just the process. Pierre de saint Aguavide, still only 128 thumbs up. Listen, um, it's wonderful for anybody that's enjoying this just to give us a wee thumbs up if you are if you are enjoying it. It does help with YouTube and things like that. But I'm just happy to have you here and hanging out. The thumbs are incidental, honestly. Gixxer or Skipper, Luke is in, say, not Campbellton, but I'm sipping an Arnamurk and Spirit 20, 2019 AD after hearing about it on the Lockdown Whiskey Festival. Very impressed. I've only tried those releases at festivals, and I have very much felt like you, Luke, as well. Very impressed and wanted to explore a wee bit further. And maybe pick one of those up. Of course, they're threatening to release a single malt at the end of this year, maybe early next year. Chris B, good to see you, Chris. If you want to see that plant outside in the next Recycled Review, it's now part of the show. <laughs> I want to see. Fantastic. Matthew Barrett is saying, I also had a plastic decorative plant for a long time, but recently my wife made me throw it out. Sad day. Yeah. Eric Evans is saying, I'll drag my Glen Scotia 15 out to toast with you. I enjoy that Glen Scotia 15 very much. Often get some savoury meat notes from that. See if you can get any savoury uh, notes in it tonight, my friend. Lee J. Brown is saying, uh, no Campbelltown on my shelf, so sipping a Glen Goyne 12 year. I don't mind if you're having a cup of tea, Lee J. I don't matter what's in your glass, it's just the fact that you're hanging out and enjoying a bit of time away from all the craziness in the world right now. Let's, uh, way behind schedule, head down to our next distillery. It means me uncorking another bottle as we go to something that isn't owned by Jane A. Mitchell, but something that's owned by the Loch Lomond Group. Um, we're going to head over to Glen Scotia now. And our host at Glen Scotia will be my friend and fellow Glaswegian, uh, a fine spirits retailer and purveyor, and uh, as it turns out, secretary of the Glasgow Whiskey Club. Roddy Graham. <laughs> Fantastic. I recognise you despite the disguise. 
<laughs> Please tell me that that's your wife slash daughters or somebody's. Uh, yeah, that belongs. Can you can you hear me all right, Roy? Yeah, perfect. Absolutely. Yeah, perfect. yeah. I was just. I, I, I've got the. You've stuck it. Dad and yeah. Aye. Nope, um, yeah, that's that belongs to one of the girls. Um, <laughs> she'll be if she if she was into whiskey and watching this, she'd be mad at me for stealing her hat. But um, she doesn't she, like whiskey, so. But she's not going to know unless we tell no. her, right? Yeah. <laughs> Everybody's having a wee laugh, and I'm very, very glad. After you not being able to join us at Kalila for the Isla tour aye, a couple of weeks aye. ago, it made sense to have you come in cover Kilkerran and Glen Scotia for us, my friend. Aye, aye, aye. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, Glen Scotia for me is an interesting story. I would say that Glen Scotia is one of those distilleries and I don't mean to be rude about it because I love what's coming out of Glen Scotia right now. But for me, my Glen Scotia journey has been a bit of a... <coughs> The whiskey ref who's in tonight, I remember him buying a tasting set of uh, drinks by the dram, all Glen Scotia malts. And uh, we we really enjoyed it. I think four out of the five that we shared that night, um, just drinks by the dram shares, we loved. And we weren't familiar with Glen Scotia back then at all. And I went off confidently striding into the landscape buying Glen Scotia, thinking that that I could just, I, I would I'd discover this fantastic distillery. And I found a couple along the way that were, challenging odd i mean bizarre the campbelltown funk was there in some of them other ones not bizarre wine casks and some of them were some of them were from independent bottlings honestly but some of them were odd whiskies and it made me take a step back and then was, you realize sorry go ahead was that would that be when the official bottlings had the the psychedelic cows on the labels uh, one was a psychedelic cow bottle, and uh, they, and that that was actually in a pub though. I didn't. I uh, I got it. I got it from. But that's gone back about ten years now, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I think they they kind of went away. Maybe about two thousand and twelve was the last that we saw of them. The disco cows, but that was the, the disco cows. Those were, official, those were official bottlings. Yeah. Uh -huh. So I, I'm talking about an SMWS one that I had. I'm talking about right. um, a, a couple of other kind of independent bottlings that would have been probably characterful, enjoyable whiskies if I'd known in advance what I was getting into. But I went into those thinking that it was going to be like the Glen Scotia's that the whiskey Rev and I had enjoyed. Mm -hmm. Little did I realize that the ones that we'd enjoyed were perhaps more in line with. Uh, let's say the more recent, and, and you need to step in and interrupt me if I'm speaking out of turn or if you think I'm mistaken here, but more recent bottlings from Glen Scotia have been uh, wholly fantastic to me. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that's indie and especially the core official range. Um, but as our host at Glen Scotia tonight, what would be your <laughs> thoughts down there? In, at, 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 uh, in um, well, I'd, I'd agree with you that uh, the from from 2014 when the the now departed owners took over the, the cask selection for the official range was absolutely fantastic um, the, the current range that, that they kind of worked out is you know there's some very very fine drums in there um, pr you know prior to that the disco cows uh, were very uh, I really liked the 12 year old um, I thought it was a lovely Kind of a bit like Kilkerran 12, you know, like a nice everyday dram. Not as right. complex as that. But some of the other disco cows were absolutely terrible whiskies. Really, you know, you, you were wondering what they what they were doing when they were bottling them. And I think it's, there, there was, you know, if you go back 10 years, there was an awful lot of indie bottlings that were just, people bottled them because they felt they had to have a Glen Scotia in the range, yep. but... Some, some, you know, there was some real duff casks. Um, there's, there's a, there's a somebody. Um, I, 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 I'll not mention him by name because he may not want to. Uh, this, to, to be linked to this, but um, it's a fellow that used to work in Campbelltown, uh, who was into his whiskey. He's into his whiskey and uh, got into the habit of he would nip along to Glen Scotia Distillery and just sort of pop in and talk to the 
the guys that were working in there, you know, which at this in the in the at that point it would have been people coming over from Springbank to yes. to to keep Clint Scotia running. And he got to know uh, one of the stillmen well enough that after a while he would pop over there and this fellow would just tell him to do stuff. <laughs> this the, <laughs> the help. This yes, the, you know, like as soon as you're just blethering to me, you might as well help me to make this whiskey, you know. Uh, and can you help me move these barrels about? Uh, and that, uh, you know, he was, he, uh, the way he tells the story, he was delighted to have that opportunity to sort of see that side of the the, the operation. And, you know, he, he got paid for it in in, the, in whiskey as well. Um, but it kind of, it sums up the way that Glen Scotia was run for a long time. You know, it was run on a part-time basis. They got people to come in from Springbank to yes to to run it, and you you could tell from the what was being bottled that the the cask selection was terribly haphazard. You know, uh-huh. you, well, you, well, it was a kind of um, belt and braces, minimal kind of piecemeal thing operation for a while. I think you, mm-hmm. that would be late eighties into the nineties, two thousand, and into into the early two thousands as well. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, um, and there wasn't a lot of money around. I know that no, when no. Uh, I can't remember the name of the equity firm before the current owners, still Loch Lomond Group, of course, uh, when they when they took over, uh, they invested heavily. Mm-hmm. And I remember stories about I don't know if it was the Masham or the Stillhouse not having a roof. It was that bad at Glen Scotia, <laughs> right? <laughs> We're talking yeah, about very dilapidated old buildings, and uh, yet through sheer determination they were still able to keep the, the thing running mm-hmm. the spirit the spirit being produced but i guess what we can extrapolate from your comments there from my kind of opinions there that maybe cask management back then was kind of maybe a better thing to say would be the cask management now is very much a focus whereas back yeah. then it was just keeping the production running and mm-hmm. we're very very glad that they did manage to keep the production running um, mm. Because what's coming out and now, I think you feel the same way as me. What's coming out of Glen Scotia now is very interesting. Mm-hmm. We went to the Inter Whiskey Festival in Frankfurt in Germany last year, and and I, those things are all day things. It's not like the Glasgow Festival that you're in and out in three four hours because you know that's enough drinking. Thanks. The the German festivals are a different structure, and you're in master class after master class. And after eight master classes over the weekend, the last one I was in was Glen Scotia. And by that time, I was pretty tired. My palate would have been pretty tired. And yet, I came out of that Glen Scotia master class thinking, "Wow, thank God for Glen Scotia. Thank God that they're back. Thank God that they're bringing these things." Now, mm-hmm. a couple of the whiskies that we tried were single casks releases for Germany, for Europe. I understand they were kind of special whiskies, but one of them was this. Um, what 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 do you have tonight? Um, the same, Roy, the same. Superb. Uh, Superb. So what we have, I'll let you introduce it, Roddy. Okay, so this is a um, no-age statement cask strength whiskey. It's the Glen Scotia Victoriana. Um, this one, I, have we got the same strength? This one's bottled at 54.2, Roy. 54.2. It does right, say so cask the, strength, yep. Yeah, the, the, the first batch was about 51%. Uh, so not cask strength, and the the um, the pitch for this is that it's a whiskey that's um, harking back to a, a lost style or a, an old fashioned style. So it's it's one of the peatier Glen Scotias, and there's a there's a there's a, a whack of sherry influence in it as well, um, and it's you know it's strong and youngish, so something like the way that whiskey might have been drunk. 100 years ago. Yeah, if we talk about the boom time, the peak times in, in Campbelltown being that Victorian era, um, this is a, an attempt to, to try and recall some of the old traditional Victorian whiskey style that might have been produced at that time. I guess that's what they're... It kind of it reminds me a little bit of that, um, what they tried to do at Aberlour when they released the, the Abuna, mm-hmm. they're trying to recreate that old style. Um, so perhaps um, while there's mature, there's definitely mature well-aged whiskey in here um, and I've not sipped it yet but my, the way I recall this is that there's a lot of kind of 
uh, vibrant, younger, bolder whiskies in there as well, much like it would have been perhaps back mm -hmm. in the day, much like an Aberla or a Buna or something, quite some young components in there as well. Slanchy Roddy, cheers. Cheers, Roy. Cheers. So, yeah, I, it, that the, agricultural thing, that it's almost yes. industrial. It's like you've walked into a mechanics, it's like you've walked into a garage or a, something. Or, there's a, it's, it's difficult to articulate. It's like, Maybe it's maybe it's farmyard, but it's there's something more kind of oily, or something about this. I think um, this. I find this to be fruitier than the Kilkerrans that I've just been tasting, um, but it does have some sort of. Uh, did you say diesel, Roy? You know, I didn't. Sort of, but, I didn't say diesel, but but it's some kind of or you know engine, not engine oil, but like uh, lubricating I, I, oil. I think you'd be misleading somebody if you said oil, engine oil. Yeah, Certainly not anything as gross yeah. as a gearbox oil, right? But no, you're, no, no, it's no. something. It reminds me of, or like when you open a drawer that's full of tools or something, or it's, it's maybe a metallic industrial thing. It's definitely fruity. There's lots of fruit there. It's even quite tropical, honestly. But but first, it, when you first knows it, the, and in contrast with that really, really kind of rich coquerin that we had, the first thing that strikes me is this kind of really, and, and you recognize it as kind of something that you would associate with Campbelltown whiskies. But it's something that's, I think if I let my wife smell this, I think she would get it as well. She's not a huge whiskey fan, uh -huh. but she, she picks the obvious kind of, things that sit just beyond the obvious whiskey, generic whiskey flavor smell thing that most new people get. She's, she picks the next thing back. Mm -hmm. You know what it's making me think of? Um, it's a, my grandfather had a, a shed that was, it was on the, it was an old farm building. So uh, just through the wall was a, um, a store for, uh, hay, yeah, you know the bales of hay, and then his this shed of his was full of tools that were well maintained, and the, this particular shed had an earth floor, and it's these ah. three components. It's like hay, and that earthy thing, and the smell of tools. You know, a sort of, you know, there's a hint of of some kind of oil or grease it would use for maintenance. You know. I have to say, I, I'm, I'm right with you, but I glanced at the chat and Andy Arbaggy has said oily rag metallic. Yeah, metallic, iron. Aha, uh -huh. that kind of, um, and the oily rag thing makes sense, but <coughs> like a, a gauze, a kind of canvas, that's kind of, but then you, as you sip it, canvas. that's that's not that's on the nose as you sip it and you drink it that's kind of not i'm not tasting metallic notes no no it's I'm, it's I'm not, really fruity yeah absolutely absolutely like almost as i said it was you that pointed out the fruit the tropical almost a tropical fruit well, which I was, is, I was like banana loaf or something you know like banana bread maybe i and now that now that you've got me in baked fruit and things and But this, if you gave this to someone blind, I think this plays like a mature whiskey. This tastes like a teenager. There's, it tastes mature to me. And I think that what would put people off when they look at this is they would see the price of this, which is, it's not cheap. It's about 80 mm -hmm. quid. Am I yeah, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then they would see uh, this 80 quid whiskey from this distillery that perhaps don't know very well and no age statement on there. Mm -hmm. And that's when, you know, the age statement thing, th there's reasons. F I mean, it would be, I'm always one of these people that say, just be confident, just put the age on there, just tell us what it is. Some some distilleries are confident enough to put a, a young bold like an eight or a five even there from Ben Romack and the new Arbeg is going to have a five on there, right? Mm -hmm. 
that's all good. But sometimes that doesn't represent the whiskey, and I understand that. But it would be nice if the description on the back gave us a hint of that, of how they can't give us the makeup. I understand that. But if it, if it, I mean, I read the, the, I read the tube, the box that this came in, and it's just a kind of loose story. It doesn't yeah. really, mm -hmm. it doesn't really tell you why they've created this whiskey that's quite expensive to put together, but still has a non-age statement on it. And it's only through trying this that you realise, wow, this is a decent dram. Mm -hmm. I think uh, when it was launched. Uh, they didn't. They didn't give ages, uh, but you know, in the sort of chat that the kind of chat that you get from whiskey producers that they can never put on a label because of the, the regulations. But if you're talking to them face to face, they'll tell you the. And this is this is the previous batch, which wasn't labelled as cask strength, so it was more like. You know, they they were pitching it as being a drinking strength whiskey. Um, yes. Uh, but there were there was there was from memory there's there's young whiskey and it's it's a bit like the original Ugadal. Um so you know like there's a good batch of five year old whiskey or there was but then there's there's also a good chunk of uh, Much you know stuff. fifteen twenty year old sherry matured stuff um, I, that might not be true for the second batch. But you, you you can still taste, as you say, Roy, that there's 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 mature spirit in there, there's older spirit, as well uh -huh. as the younger stuff. Um, I, I, th I think if somebody poured this for you, you would appreciate that it was higher ABV. Mm -hmm. But I think you would think you'd been poured a nice rich teenager or something of that order. It, it, mm -hmm. That's how it. Um, I mean, there, there is there's the nice vibrance to it. It's it's bright and it does communicate with you in terms of ABV it's the alcohol's there but it doesn't mm. get in the way no you know what it actually is I don't think it's quite as sweet but it, it reminds me a wee bit of Springbank 15 uh, oh, that's and, I, and I mean that I mean that as a as a compliment, compliment. You know, I think that's, yep. that's a Springbank 15 is a grand grand whiskey I'm going to put a wee scoosh of water in it just to see what happens here <laughs> um I don't have Carl any water to Good to see you, Connell. Good to welcome you in. Uh, somebody was uh, uh, talking, uh, or very happy to be sipping an Ardnamurchan 2019 AD earlier in the chat. Good to, good to welcome you in here. Uh, Gregor McQuee is here. Fantastic, Gregor. Good to see you. Graham Fraser is saying, got that oily note on the Glen Scotia Chocolate. double cask, but it disappeared quickly. So maybe it's something that does as the bottles open and oxidizes a wee bit. It, it, I have to say, I don't want it to, to go away. I quite like it. I like that um, I mean, it does command your attention, you are and it's because you can't, for me, I can't always articulate it. I'm trying to work out what it is I'm actually smelling. It's something that's familiar to me, but, and it's definitely that environment, it's in that order. Matthew Parks is saying, I'm getting slightly chocolatey nose beneath the Campbelltown funk, very pleasant. I saw that, yeah. Mm -hmm. I get that, I get that too, Matthew. Uh, it's a, a very specific kind of cheap chocolate. Uh, I don't know if people that are my age might uh, might remember a sweetie called Chelsea Whoppers. Yes, absolutely. Which, which was the chocolate. <laughs> no. It was fake chocolate, right? It was fake chocolate. Aye. But once you got a taste for Chelsea Whoppers, there was no chocolate could touch it, right? <laughs> it was like, there's a really funny um, uh, uh, apologies for the uh, the colloquial chat. Talking of which, it's a great, Gregor has just said "skush." How <laughs> how many mil is that Aquavite Glasgow slang? <laughs> I'll tell you something really funny. Gregor is out in Oregon in the west coast of the States, but he's an Edinburgh lad. He's from Edinburgh. And we were drinking okay. together in the pot still, and Sevi and I were talking to each other, and one of us said, your tea's out. Your tea's out. <laughs> and, and Gregor just kind of stopped for a minute. He had to pause, and he processed, and then he went, your tea's out. He went, ah, uh, your dinner's ready? Like, <laughs> <laughs> And it's funny because we're both in the same country, but just those expressions just kind of... Uh, but yes, your tea suit means um, it's all over. You have to pick up the ball and come in now. You can't play anymore. Your tea suit. Silic so Bang is here. Good to see you. Saying some of the best SMWS bottles I've had have been Glen Scotia and Fairly Young. Yeah, maybe a measure of more of the recent influences that the current owners um, or the people that's steering the ship there now have, have, 
have had. Multi Agus the... one uh, massive shout, Chelsea Whoppers, he's very happy. <laughs> and Donald Rice is saying Glen Scotia Victoriana retails for a hundred Canadian here. Is it worth the price? That's about that seems quite quid. cheap. That seems pretty cheap. Uh, the, I would I would grab that. Don't even think about it, Donald. That's an amazing price. Um, really, really good. And you might find in Canada, you've still got the original one that, that, that Roddy said didn't have the cast strength written on it. Mm -hmm. And it was different ABV, around 51%. I think Roddy's yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Jimmy, like said, uh, Aquaviti, oily, goes waxy, goes Klein Leash, goes great. Klein Leash. Uh, this one, maybe he's not talking about this. Oh, it's oily. No, so, so the oily I'm talking about is not a texture oil. It's I'm trying to pinpoint why I'm getting a... It's funny when Roddy said well-maintained tools, but that kind of leads me towards things like WD-40 and mm. kind, of, it's kind of silicon lubricants or whatever, and it's not that at all. It's not that kind of oil. And the Arbaggi was probably closer to the idea of maybe an oily rag or some kind of gauze the, or cotton. Or, you, said, you said canvas... Uh, uh -huh, something like that. Like yeah. you know, the if you've got maybe maybe sort of getting into like waxed canvas or something like that, perhaps. Do you know the so the if you've got a, a all I'm getting wax is, is fruit. No, just fruit. Uh, yeah, I'm getting lots of dried fruit now, uh, which is you know like classic sherry cask notes, so sort of raisins and cheap chocolate. I paid eighty pounds for an orange statement whiskey, <laughs> and I, I, I'm, I don't care. I'm very, very happy. Right, it's, it's think, a good dram. I think it's a, just a, a good dram. I mean, I would like for that eighty pounds. Honestly, as I said earlier, if I was to be critical at all, I would just like a wee bit more insight, a wee bit more information about how they've put it together. We've used older stock. We've used younger stock. We've come together because we're trying to make this specific profile. I was kind of looking for something that would suggest or even hark back. The only thing on this bottle that tells us that they're trying to recreate that older style is the name Victoriana. Mm -hmm. So maybe that that's changed from the original bottling as well. Maybe there was that kind of story. I, I think, you know, uh, when it was launched, you know, that was that was very clearly part of the, the story. And I think uh, they've, they've perhaps slightly shifted away from that, you know. The, the, the well, there is mention now that I read the small print on the, the, the print that I can hardly read. It does talk about um, Campbelltown was known as the Victorian whiskey capital of the world, married in small batches and bottled at cast strength without filtering. Mm. It's subtle wood and vanilla flavour, full-bodied spicy aroma and mild, mildly smoky aftertaste. Now, I'm not getting any sm We haven't even touched on smoke. The, I think this is this is a uh, less smoky than the previous batch. I think the the original one was peatier. Um, the I, I might still have the original batch somewhere. I could go and rummage for it, but I don't want to. I'll not do that just now. Yeah. We're going to run it hellish late tonight. Are you in a curfew, you know, Roddy? Are you you hanging about till the the bitter end? Are you? I am working tomorrow, but I'm good for a bit. I mean, it's only. 20 past 11. Um, what I was going to come back to uh, just before I, I lose the thread, um, the talking to people at Loch Lomond Group um, when they relaunched the range, one of the things that they were at, at pains to say was that you know, under the previous on ownership, the Loch Catrin Group, um, they, they had very much functioned as contract distillers Yes. And what they bottled under their own branding was what was left after their customers had picked the casks that they wanted. So the you know, the very often the official bottlings were kind of the dregs if you like. And when when the new when things when the ownership changed in twenty fourteen they just turned that right around so that yeah. they were they were taking casks first and then they were selling off what they didn't use for themselves, and I, I think that's that's the big change that we've seen that, that that they've got this conscious decision that they want to have their own brand rather than just using the brand as a way to get rid of what's left over. 
Absolutely. I mean, I think that that's the way it should be. As soon as you want to build a brand based on single malt output, you have to, cask management dictates that you have to know the casks that you're, that's going to fit your single malt brand first and foremost. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. it's not just the first six casks, 10 casks, mm -hmm. 60 casks off the rack that just rolls into the back of the truck, right? It's yeah. literally they, they, they hand pick. I think that that plays out. I think that so we've got a double cask as the entry level. It's very inexpensive at 35, 40 pounds of that order. And um, then we've got the 15-year-old, very savoury dram. Always get kind of smoked meats on that. I, I hesitate to say it, but I do get smoked salmon. And it was thanks to Scott at the Whiskey Club. And we're sat next to Scott and he said, I'm getting smoked salmon. And everybody at the table suddenly went, oh, yeah, you know, one of those moments. <laughs> um, I suggest that to people. And it, it, there's not, not a lot of people have got it since. It might have been just that time, it was a year or two ago. 15-year-old is there. Then after the 15-year-old, I'd say the Victoriana sl slots in about there. Then it goes on 18-year-old. Then it gets really pricey. The 18-year-old is just about affordable for an 18. 25 is expensive. Mm. It's quite an expensive dram for the 25. Uh, mm -hmm. um, but the range is the quality and the presentation, what they're going for, they're clearly preaching to the enthusiast and the type of folk that are already invested in Campbelltown whiskeys. Um, that's clear to me in, in the range. I, 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 you're nodding, so I imagine that you agree, yeah. Yeah, I do, yeah. Uh -huh. Roddy, I very much enjoyed my time at Glen Scotia with you. <laughs> I'm going to put a wee coin on this dram because I'm drinking too much cast strength whiskey to be uh, reliably running a live stream at the same time. <laughs> uh, and we're still to go down to Spring Bank and look at triple distilled hazel burn, two and a half times distilled spring bank and double distilled, I can't even look at you. <laughs> See if the sunshine was belting in the window and there were some cocks hanging off it perhaps, it would be fantastic. <coughs> Roddy, I can't wait till you're sat next to me here. You need to, get, you, you'll come back and, and have a, a, a wee night uh, once this crap's blown over, won't you? Aye, we'll, we'll, uh... We'll, we'll do Glen Burgie or something. Well, we're, we're cooking themes between us, aren't we? We've got some interesting Aye. themes. Glen Aye. Burgie's, um, I can't even remember the one that was that, that we were talking about at the last Whiskey Club, but I'll have it written down somewhere. Aye. I'm going to raise a glass to Roddy Graham and thank you for hosting us uh, at, at Glen Scotia, my friend. Cheers, Roy. Slang Slang you See you soon. jump in and say <clears throat> Roddy is not a hat man Blair I'm not a hat man either there are very few hats that I can get away with wearing I think it's to do with head shape which is why I'm nervous about just getting the clippers out and giving myself a buzz cut as well um, and my kids are not going to be happy about that because they realise just how thin I am on top as well uh, Eb Head is saying see you soon, soon Roddy absolutely Rolf Eric Evans is saying, is, I'll drag my Glen Scotia 15 out to toast with you. Tell me if you're getting savoury notes from it, uh, Eric, and tell me if you can even detect a whiff of smoked salmon. Wonderful stuff. Uh, Silverlock Whiskey Club is in. Good to see you. Thanks, Roddy. Hope to see you soon, hopefully in a few minutes again, maybe to the Spring Bank. Um, and, <laughs> and Roddy is shouting into the lounge saying, I am so a hat man. Rombo over in a uh, hot, uh, you're in Holland, aren't you? You're in the Netherlands, aren't you, Rombo? I'm sure you are. I just did that and trimmed myself. So many people are doing it. It's a big social media craze, isn't it? Everybody getting out and shaving their own heads and things because they can't get haircuts right now. Um, you never know, it might happen to yours truly as well. Gex or Skipper Lucas saying, cheers, Roddy. See you in five minutes. And Jimmy Legg is saying, if you check the Barflies Facebook page, you'll see a proper haircut. I need to check that out. It's a bit of a shame the Barflies Facebook page was built based on the lounge in this live stream, the VPUB live stream, based on the chat. And the idea was is that the Facebook group was not just another whiskey Facebook page, but it was about encouraging people to share events and ways in order for us to connect in real life. Because this VPUB, the V stands for virtual pub, but the pub is the only virtual thing. The space that we occupy is the only virtual thing. Everything else is very, very real. And so the Barflies page on Facebook was created in order to encourage people to share when they're going to an, a, a festival, an event, a tasting, a distillery, a trip abroad, and so that people could connect. 
Graham Young has bought me a virtual dram and said, cheers with Glen Scotia, rum cask dram. Fantastic, Graham. Uh, it is one that I've tried. In fact, was the festival release not a rum cask? Oh, no, it was Portwood. I think it was Portwood. Um, anyway, Slanchy Graham, thank you very much for your drama, friend. So the Barflies page was created for that reason. And now that we can't get together in real life, it's just kind of, uh, it's still growing. There are still people joining. So if you want to hang out with the Barflies um, in a Facebook environment, search for Aquavite uh, Barflies and uh, you can join uh, the community that's grown inside there as well. I, Simon Ray saying, Aquavite, uh, just look at comedian Kevin Bridges' haircut and let it grow. <laughs> Matthew Parks is saying, will the Springbank rep be wearing a hat? <laughs> <laughs> I think we are busted already. Silverlock Whiskey Club is saying V Pub is V good. Thank you so much, Silverlock Whiskey Club. And Eric Evans is saying I get a mildew filled Dunnage wood note along with the meaty note and a hint of honey heather. Sounds perfect, Eric. So, so the, those kind of um, almost Roddy talked about hay and wet hay and getting on towards silage. It's it's a part of it. It can often be found in those types of whiskies. Ben Marnock said, oops, just as it jumped. Ben Marnock said, right, what is the Springbank funk? Explanation required to someone who has never owned a Springbank. Ronnie. We need to see what we can do to try and uh, convince you that you should engage with a Springbank of some description. I have to admit that it was only five or six years ago that I was very delinquent. I had honestly, um, perhaps it was a lot to do with the fact that when you go into a shop, it's a lot to do with timing as to how much Springbank is actually available to buy on the shelf. Um, and it's to do with the fact that there was just so many other whiskies to go around and enjoy in the landscape that I was late to the Springbank party. I was late to Campbelltown, genuinely. And one of the confessions that I have to make about it will come up uh, as I reach out to our next host. <laughs> the guy that's going to look after us down at Springbank is indeed my fellow Glaswegian, my friend, <laughs> a fine spirits purveyor and secretary of the Glasgow Whiskey Club, an all-round cool and interesting guy, <laughs> uh, Roddy Graham. <laughs> now tell me, for a long time, and maybe even inside YouTube, you had a bizarre skull-like icon, the, the, and I don't know, Maybe it wasn't a skull, but it was some kind of bizarre, scary. <laughs> yes, Roddy, you're absolutely right. I, I agree with you. You are a hat man. <laughs> oh, I'm really not, I'm a... It's Campbelltown triplets. Indeed it is. Triplets all wearing the same clothes with similar opinions and similar experience in whiskey. <laughs> Thanks so much for indulging me tonight and staying for the long haul, big guy. Thank you for welcoming us down at Springbank. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. It's kept, been fun. Yes, I kept Springbank to the very end for obvious reasons. Um, Glen Giles knew. Glen Scotia has really come back into finding its own feet again and bringing out fantastic product where it can really join that Campbelltown party, honestly. But Springbank has been doing it for a long time. And when they came back, late 70s, they closed in 1979, I guess, and it was about 87, 88 before they were able to get going again. And that's kind of what the story that you shared with us at the outset, that he, he decided, Headley Wright decided, I'm not going to have my destiny in the lap of somebody else anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take control of it ourselves. We're going to build a single malt brand that people have known about for a long time, but we're going to, that's going to be our thing. And it's first and foremost. And I think we're going to talk about this. We can't not mention the fact just how big an employer Springbank is down in that community down there, but also the fact that it's the only, it's the only distillery in Scotland that takes care of its process from start to finish. And when mm -hmm. I say that, I'm not talking about farming. I'm talking about once it gets malt, it's taking care of its own malting, its own obviously mashing, fermentation, distillation, maturation, and bottling as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Media, warehousing, out, uh, marketing, all the administration, everything is in-house. Mm -hmm. It was interesting, recently I happened upon an article and they talked about there is one other distillery in Scotland that at a stretch could lay claim possibly to being able to do that 
all in house um, up into the point of bottling, not bottling. Um, do you know who, who that would be? The are we talking about Daft Mill again? No. Or no. the Bruclari? Daft Mill obviously contract out the malting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm specifically talking about a distillery in Scotland that does its own malting on site. You're going to be angry at me when I... <laughs> Glenord. Glenord? Ah, of course. <laughs> because Glenord have the drum maltings there. Yes, now, it's a bit of a stretch. It's not... Don't confuse Glenord with Springbank in any way. Springbank have very much got everything under their own command. Correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know you're a Springbank fan because mm -hmm. about the fourth or fifth dram in December that you poured, blind for me, was a Springbank 12 cast strength. It was, wasn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you, it was supposed to be under the radar whiskies that you were sharing, but you were, you, but you talked about it that night that you, that you shared it and you were compelled to talk about it. Um, and I think it does, it does justify you bringing it up at that time. It's not always available. We can't always get our hands on it. Mm hmm but it's it's a, such a compelling prospect when it comes to whiskey. Mm -hmm. Tell us how you feel about Springbank. What's your relationship with Springbank? Um, so the the uh, I, I love Springbank. Um, I, I you know I love the fact that uh, as you've mentioned, they they do everything in house. The the way that the the business is structured. Um, the the uh, the anti marketing that they have to um, uh, that they have to go through, you know, in order to try and sort of r ration out their limited supplies of whiskey. Uh, but I also love the the you know the when you go to Springbank Distillery, it, it's it. it it's kind of th things haven't really changed, you know. And you know, again, you know, you could say that they, you know, they they like to put a little bit of a spin on it and say it's because they want to keep things the old way. But <clears throat> you know, from a strictly practical point of view, they've they've kept doing things the old way because it meant they didn't have to spend any money on new equipment. Um, but you know that, and whether the whether this was just a, a a lucky coincidence or whether it's you know the incredible foresight of Mr. Wright again, but um, it means that the, the the style of whiskey that Springbank makes, um, it you know it harks back to an old fashioned style, you know kind of as we tasted in the Victoriana, which is a a, a modern interpretation of that style, if you like, based on. Yes. On cask selection, but but what Springbank do? They, they almost don't need to do the cask selection because it's, it's built incidentally. In, built you know, it's into built the into the process. You know, by um, hand. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I also love that that Springbank somehow somewhere along the way um, evolved this complicated two and a half times distillation process. You know, and you know, it's one. You know, there's a few distilleries that have that that complicated distillation process, and nobody uh, can really talk about how the distillers arrived at that. You know, because it's lost in the mists of time. But at somewhere in in the past, um, Springbank happened upon that, and then it turned out it makes an amazing style of whiskey. It defined there's, a style, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I always love when when folks say. Um, uh, can you can you describe a, a partial triple distillation to me? And and you just kind of I, I tend to glaze over and, <laughs> and use the easy out. I always just say, look, after the first distillation, there's low wines. Fifty percent of that gets redistilled again, <laughs> and eventually you have product that's been distilled three times and product that's been distilled twice, and then an aggregate of both is two and a half, and that's about as far as I can go. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's I, partial triple distillation is not not a, a great way to describe it really because it is it's it'd be more accurate to say it's a mixture of twice and three times distilled whiskey but then it's it's more complicated than that because in, in some sense to get boringly technical all whiskey includes liquid which has been through the stills 
multiple times because they're know. constantly reusing uh -huh, um, uh -huh. in the process it goes back through and it gets fed through it gets fed through there's very yeah, little yeah. waste yeah yeah so the the you know the what what springbank and mortlock and uh, ben Rennes, when they were doing it what they do is it's, it's just an extra wrinkle on the on a process that in a sense all the distillers do you know one of my favorite things about springbank uh, and i I had I been more organised, I would have sent you the picture that if you're if you're looking at the pipework uh, between the uh, the middle still and the third still at Springbank, um, there's there's a pipe that runs along the front of those, and uh, it kind of goes along and up and along and down again. But at that central section where it's along, there's a wee sticky up bit which is just cut off. And <laughs> whenever whenever I'm there, I, I, if I can pin somebody down uh, at Springbank, I ask them what it is. And they're like, yeah, you know, it just is, you know. It's it's just, it's part of the, Springbank's been there that long and it's it's just kept going, doing what it's done, that the, you know, the, the thought processes behind it are, are lost in the midst of time, but, they just know that if they keep doing what they're doing, they're going to make wonderful whiskey. So perhaps um, once upon a time, that little uppy bit did something. It went somewhere, and then it was just cut. Or ah, so if you look at it, it's it's been cut and nipped, you know, bent over to seal it. Uh, so it, it, at some point, it did go somewhere, <laughs> uh, and then they changed the process slightly and. The reason for the change is... It's just it's, uh, just so Springbank. So uh, here's the confession here. I need to make the confession now, and I think you know what it's going to be. When I make whiskey trips and make whiskey journeys and things, it's not the type of thing I can pack the kids up and the wife and mm -hmm. go off on a family holiday. It has to be pockets of time that you carve out. And people think you live in Scotland. You should be able just to nip off and visit all these distilleries at your whim. But really... Campbelltown as a day trip is a big challenge. I know that people do it, it's possible, but it's difficult. And to enjoy the whiskey, you would really have to be having accommodation. So you're looking at weekends and so it's difficult. So the amount of times I've been to Isla, to the Highlands, to Speyside, to, it's honestly, when you've got a family and other responsibilities, it's difficult. Mm -hmm. So you know the confession I'm gonna come out with. I have yet, in, in a whiskey context, I have yet to visit Campbelltown. Mm -hmm. I've yet to take a tour of a distillery there. I mean, I know what the town looks like. I've been to the town. I've, I've gone there perhaps before I was this passionate about whiskey. I've just leisurely driven down the peninsula till I couldn't drive any further. And it, I just so happened to be in Campbelltown. Mm -hmm. But I didn't understand the context of, of whiskey in, back then. And I've never been to Campbelltown on a whiskey event. And that, to me, is something... Well, it was going to be remedied in May this year. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, it can happen now, Aye, okay. um, but uh, but it needs to be remedied quick, um, quickly because um, I want to see that we uppy bit. <laughs> 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 I want to see what Roddy was talking about. I mean, it's, I'm I'm sure it's nothing, you know. It, it's just it, it's you don't. Well, actually, you know what? There's there's one other distillery that's a wee bit like that. Um, if you go to Strathila. Um, yes. There's a, and if you look at the 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 line arm on one of the stills, uh, one you know they're both sort of you know the the line arm that's the pipe that comes down off yeah. the top of the still. Yeah. Um, the you know most stills there's there's kind of a a straight thing um, that will either be up or down or horizontal, and some have got. An extra wee pipe that comes out of it, but it's just Isla. One of the, one of the, uh, the line arms on one of the stills has got a wee kink in it, just a wee divot, uh, which that's that's going to have the effect of reducing the reflux, because you know that wee the downward dip means that it's going to be harder for vapor to go back the way. Yes, but the reason for that kink is not. 
I know the in story. Order to, gonna, it's not it. in order to, to reduce the reflux. It's so that the line arm will fit under the roof beam <laughs> that's at that point in the still house. So, so maybe, maybe uh, when at some point in the past when they were doing some maintenance at Springbank, they had to replace that section of pipe, and they found another section of pipe that happened to have a T joint in it, and rather than waste it, rather than throw it away, they just cut off the 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 T joint and sealed it, <laughs> and it's got hee haw to do with the the, I, I, the process. I wouldn't be surprised at all um, if that's if they just kind of it could, because it does that kind of stick and plaster and sellotape held together with chewing gum and excitement is very yeah. much a theme of what you pick up from and as i've already mentioned i've not actually yes. been able to uh -huh. see it but you get that that whole vibe it's not just in how they make the whiskey it's how they put it out there into the marketplace it's mm -hmm. how they it's everything that they do is just very <coughs> it's almost like they're just letting the whiskey take care of itself honestly i mean I'm, that's not to be i'm sure they're making every effort to make the best whiskey they possibly can make but it's almost like what it will be it will be um they shun automation um mm -hmm. maybe that's down to investment maybe that's just maybe it's because they don't want to change the whiskey but what's amazing to me is when we talk about two and a half times this distillation, that's the vast majority. Then there's about 10 or 15% triple distilled for Hazelburn, 10 or 15% for Long Row. But the, all of that isn't that much whiskey compared to the theoretical capacity. And then you hear about things like uh, when the when Kilkerran 12 hit the market, we, you and I talked about this, I mentioned this to you, and, it, and I passed, I was at the Good Spirits Company, a tasting, I tasted Kilkerran 12, wonderful whiskey. Everybody came out and bought it. There wasn't any left. I said, no big i'll come back and get some and you're like yeah, yeah there'll be there'll be more yeah. but it was months and months for more mm -hmm. cocaine and 12 to appear and you made some inquiries and we we asked it was, was it, no it's here it's, it's it's we're just waiting for it to get to the bottling line what's the hold up in the bottling line and it's because they're they're bottling for caden heads they're bottling for other brands at springbank the bot there's contract bottling perhaps i don't know and they say well how long is it going to be and it's going to be weeks and weeks the whiskey was there it was just it takes however long it takes that's how long it's going to take mm. and then we heard that they drastically increased the capacity in their bottling line and we thought that they'd invested in a new line and new equipment and no they just put on another shift <laughs> and it's that fantastically often frustrating but really endearing culture that seems to exist around that distillery mm -hmm. fascinating mm -hmm. what's your favorite spring bank um, the one, the one I always return to is the twelve-year-old uh, cask strength. You know, I think you know the. It's a it's priced to be a, an everyday whiskey. I mean, you obviously I'm lucky in that I, I sell the stuff, so I can I can sell myself a bottle uh, whenever it comes into the shop. You know, uh, I I think. Um, uh, for me, Springbank's best in its teens. You know, I've been lucky enough to taste a few older ones, uh, which are you know it's a great privilege to, to taste sort of rare whiskies like that. But the, I think the Springbank for me, you know, you still want it to have a, a bit of a wee bit of a bite to it. So, you know, the um, this this is the one for me. So, which batch is that? Um, Five point three. Does that say? Yeah, I think this must be the latest one. The, the, let me grab a glass. Let's share that together. Let's share one of these. Um, right. I'm down to my, my final glass. I've got more glasses over there, but this is a Sipper Social Club, Jeremy's glass. So, Kings. Yeah, it's quite, uh, a, quite a shape. That one is, this had a, this is so old that the, the print on it's faded, but I think it's a Deanston Festival glass. I don't know if you remember Deanston did a whiskey festival for a couple of years. Or do they, are I, they still doing that? I, I they, don't think so. I don't think so. They were doing it. Uh, were they not doing something in alongside the, or maybe it was just a promotional thing that they had alongside the Highland Games up there? Was that what it was? Um, 
that kind of that rings a wee bell. That rings yeah, it's a bell. It's been back but, a few years now. So. Now I've I've poured a reasonable dram into this, and it's, it looks quite shallow because of the size <laughs> of the. So what this uh, I know, I've I've opened this and enjoyed this already. It's a it's a peach. I, I'll recall a story that you shared to me about one of the releases. Cheers. Mm. We were both enjoying one of the releases going back about a year ago, I think it was uh, this time last year. Mm -hmm. But you commented that um, it took you by surprise because while it was still a good whiskey, it was not what you expected for a Springbank 12 cast strength release. Mm -hmm. Can you can you comment on that? I think that was, was that more because there was more bourbon cask in there? Was it because it was... The that was that was the February twenty nineteen, and it was it was it, there was more bourbon cast, but also it was quite a strong one. Like the they're always cast strength, but it varies quite a lot. So you know it goes between. I think it's been as low as fifty two, maybe, and that that one last year was fifty seven, and it took I, I had to have the bottle open for about six months before it it stopped being very fiery for me, because uh, this is. At what do we say, fifty five? Fifty five point three. Um, yeah, this is uh, this is not fiery at all. You know, this is a lovely sweet drum. It's got it's got that in that industrial thing that we're trying to pin down earlier. You know that kind of what was it? Andy said about tool, no, tools or tool sheds, wet yeah, rag. rag. For me, this is, yeah, it has still got that, but this is more, I'm in a farmyard here. This is... Farmyard. It's fermenting matter of some mm -hmm. description, It's it's, but it's rich, and it's, I know that fermenting matter sounds <laughs> very off-putting, but it's not, it's nice, it's, it's rich. Would you, would you say grassy again? I absolutely, but I'm t if we're talking about we're talking about we're we're not talking about fresh, bright spring green grass. We're speaking about damp, wet. Yeah. Um, Again, it's the silage thing or haylage. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it, it is like you're you're walking through a some kind of agricultural environment, some kind of barn. Just right. Only five minutes. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Right. Sorry. You get you're you're getting your parachute pulled. The I have to go and uh, evacuate a spider from the bathroom. Uh, okay. Well, that, no, that's a, that's a that's a very very important job. <laughs> I'll tell you what. The, we'll do. I'll tell you what we'll do is as if. We're, we're hugely late. I am hugely late tonight. I was very naive to think that we could cover Campbelltown in a nice little um, pocket of time. What are you st Once you've taken care of the spider, <laughs> once, you've done, once you've done your Robert the Bruce and the Gauldrons, it's very on top, <laughs> right? Um, you're going to come back and hang out for the quiz, right? Hi, 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 hi. Okay, good. Um, so what we'll do is we'll let you go and take care of the spider. I'll finish up with the chat. Um, and we'll we'll realise that we'll probably have to talk about Springbank at length sometime in the future, um, because we haven't even touched on their heavily peated stuff yet, or the mm. triple distilled hazel bump. I know, so we, I know. But we can maybe talk about that as we go through the quiz tonight, and and try and uh, and try and have us have it so that we're not up until one a.m. in the morning. Again. Um, <laughs> right. uh, again. <laughs> There's lots of spider emojis coming out of the chat. Roddy, you go and deal with that and I'll look out when you're coming back again, okay? That is a genuine emergency. It happens in this house regularly. I have to go and get Lynn to come and deal with the spiders in our house. Yes, I'm I'm absolutely joking. I'm kidding. <laughs> Greg's whiskey guy is saying never have enough of Campbelltown Roy. I have to say, I know where you're coming from, Greg. I was naive tonight. I thought that we'd be able to, based on us being able to do a, a session in Isla a couple of weeks ago where we went around five out of the nine distilleries on Isla in one night, I thought we could do a similar thing. Um, but I think I've enjoyed having Roddy here. And I, 
and I always want to try and get as much of Roddy out of these streams because I know how much you guys will enjoy just listening to how he um, enjoys whiskey and enjoys talking about it as well. <laughs> Rolf is spot on. He's saying Aquavita, it's okay, Roy. It's an Easter extended special. Of course, it's a holiday weekend. Whether or not we are actually able to enjoy our holiday weekend in the current situation, um, the fact remains that it remains Easter weekend. Silver Loch, Loch Whiskey Club is saying, Spider-Man of the hour, Rod Graham. Absolutely. Jimmy Legg is saying, I'm not kidding. Big spiders like Amazon spiders, I'd rather deal with a great white. I'm not scared of spiders. I don't mind them at all. Stu Baby saying, check the legs on it. <laughs> and Orange Orange Will is saying, fusty silage. Fusty is a great word, and it's a Scottish word. And I think that we you only make a word like that when you live in an environment such as Scotland, where it, um, you know, the dampness, the humidity in the air throughout the wintertime and things like that, that even in dry environments, the humidity can get in. So it settles on paper and over time, you can everything, anything theoretically in Scotland can end up with this smell to it, this dank. And we love to say that word, that fusty. We know what fusty means. It's a very, uh, a very descriptive word for that. Fusty is a good word, Orange Will, absolutely. Michael Taylor is sipping on, on the 12, uh, cast in 57.1 batch, 19, 2019, nine delicious. Slanchia. I don't know if I've got that one. Uh, the other two, I think I've got a 2018 and an early 2019. Phil Whiskey Mystery is saying, uh, there is a single barrel 21 year old Springbank here in our local store. Ex-bourbon that I have fallen in love with, trying to justify buying 10 bottles for the future. 10 bottles. Um, I have to say that there, there. Um, I can't think of many Spring Bank release uh, ex bourbon cask. I, I spoke about the fourteen year old release that they had. I loved it. I really did enjoy it. Um, I thought it was fantastic. Um, but I can't think of many. There's often uh, huge, generous dollops of sherry in their vattings, right from their ten. Uh, the fifteen is a little bit lighter in sherry. I would say eighteen is much more uh, rich and, and sherry influenced. Uh, to, to my experience, we don't actually know what's in there, as we've talked about earlier. Uh, and the 12 year old cast strength is just uh, it's wonderfully rich, Dram. Fantastic stuff. Our baggy saying, Roy, what would be your dream spring bank? I think I would love to. Um, I love going to the old and rare and seeing all the older whiskies that's available, all those old, old hard bags and old spring banks and things from the 60s. Um, but they're, they're super expensive because they're rare. Honestly, they're rare and they're in demand. Um, but I think it might be nice to 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 taste if the modern Springbank is is genuinely like a modern equivalent um, of what a traditional Springbank used to be. Um, to answer in a more kind of modern context, um, I love the ten. I love Springbank ten. I really do. Twelve cast strength, wonderful at what it does. I love the eighteen. I enjoy. I enjoy them all. Honestly, I do. Hazelburn, I enjoy. I remember the whiskey rev and I. He bought a Hazelburn, I think it was a 10-year-old Rundlitz in Kilderkins, which is a, a special edition from Hazelburn using smaller casks. And I remember him and I enjoying that bottle. It was his bottle. And every time we poured a dram, we were there was something unique about it. There was something that we couldn't articulate, something that was absolutely unique to that dram, that bottle that we were sharing. And as time went on after that bottle that we shared, we came to understand that that was that Campbelltown funk, that kind of, that deep, dark tank, charismatic, enigmatic, elusive element that seems to exist in old school whiskies, certainly old school whiskies that come from Campbelltown. Michael is saying, uh, Barfly is just pouring a little of the nine-year-old nine Barolo, that's a Hazelburn, nine year old Barolo cask Hazelburn. Uh, anyone else had this one? It's lovely, very fruity. Yes, I have. Um, I thought it was the one I had here, but the one I have here is actually a sherry cask one now. I enjoyed my time with, with that, which is typically a, a whiskey that I wouldn't normally enjoy, but the Hazelburn Barolo was very, very nice. Um, Donald Pass Whiskey is saying, Jim, the whiskey novice, did such a good job with the info on his Springbank 12 cast strength video. 
very much enjoying what Jim's bringing out as well. You'll find Jim over on the Whiskey Novice channel. Jim from Northern Ireland is usually in. He might even be in here tonight. And Simon Ray saying Aquavita, it's been great. Lovely to have Roddy back and a fantastic excuse to drink some fine whiskies. Well, I think what we're going to do since we're running so late is just have Roddy back in, talk a little bit about um, uh, Hazelburn and Longrow, give them their place, and then go straight into the quiz and let you guys off higher for the rest of the night. We've gone on quite a while tonight. I'm really surprised, but I'm, honestly, I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying Roddy being here. I'm enjoying just kind of hanging out on a Thursday night and talking about a... Uh, uh, a fascinating subject that is Campbelltown whiskey. Roddy, have you dealt with said spider? I have, yes. Uh, he's back outside. Um, Was he a carpet but, burner? Uh, what do you mean by that? The ones with the wee tiny bodies and the big long legs that go as fast as lightning across the, ca the carpet as you're watching TV. <laughs> oh, no, no. It was one of these... One of these great big buggers. Excuse me. One of these very big ones that um, just kind of <clears throat> legs. Yeah, I, you know, one of the one of the sort of if you you know the you know the ones that are kind of almost that size. You know, I'll tell you a story. Yeah. My previous house to here, we had a big conifer out the front of the house, and my wife hated it. She wanted it chopped down, so it, it was a big old tree. So we got a guy out. To, he came and chopped it down, and he chopped it up into little pieces and left it around the back of the house. It cost extra for him to dispose of it, apparently. <laughs> and stubborn me said, no, I'm going to dispose of this tree. <laughs> it was chopped up in bits and I was taking it away bit by bit. But it, it was a lot of tree and it, it stayed there a bit too long. One day I just took, I was in the right mood and I just decided to get rid of this tree. And I was picking up lots of little bits that were left over after the big bits were in the back of the car. And a bit stuck to my sock. I was wearing shorts and short socks and a bit stuck to my sock. And I reached out, it, it was a conifer, so ever so slightly prickly or jaggy, you know, that hangs onto your clothes, it was stuck to everything. And I reached down and I grabbed this last piece from my sock and picked it up and it was a spider. Oh. I was holding it in my hand and it, it was like holding a crab's leg. And, it, and as I'm holding it, this thing spun round and grabbed onto my hand and it was huge. It had a face and an expression and everything. I screamed like a girl and it ended up eight feet in the air and <laughs> just running around the garden. It's the only oh, time man. I've genuinely been afraid of, of a spider and I don't like to think about that now. So I think the spider that you dealt with tonight with tonight might have been one of those. It, was, it wasn't as bad as that. It wasn't, it wasn't the oh, kind of spider that you imagine just hope, thinking you've got a twig. And, and it's a twig that suddenly wraps itself around your hand. Jeez. Um, yeah, I, no. yeah I, I did get a bit of a fright. And a poor spider, you can imagine, I just, I don't know where he ended up, but hopefully. Yeah, hopefully In your neighbor's good. garden. In your neighbor's garden. Aye. Well, both my neighbors were nice. So ho hopefully it ended up in a, a nice wee spot and it just went off and it's still there now, <laughs> weaving webs and hiding and cut down conifers. Anyway, I mentioned that we would make a quick mention of Hazelburn and Longrow. I mean, you, you're you not a huge fan of Hazelburn? The, I have to confess, Hazelburn is, is one of these whiskies that um, I don't get it. Uh, the I know that l loads of people get very excited by it. Um, and I'm always, you know, happy to taste them, but I, I'm just, I'm left, I'm, you know, I'm looking at other people being excited and I'm like, what's going on, you know? So it's it's kind of a failing on my part um, that uh, I just, you know, it's well, kind I, of a... It's, it's a just, very interesting, that kind of subjective thing. I do, I do like Hazelburn but, and I, I like the Hazelburn 10. I like the Rundlitz and Kilderkins. The Hazelburns that I didn't love or the, you know, the, a couple of years in a row now, they've put out the very heavily sherried hazel burns. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the 14 and the 13, I think they both were. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's a bit like the Coquerin 8. I, I, I talked about it being, this is a good whiskey, nice good whiskey. Uh, we, we, and just a notch too high in the kind of sulfury elements to me in the sherry. For, right. But, but mm -hmm. what, it, what it was to me is it was, a, it was a decent whiskey, but it wasn't a great example of hazel burn. Right. It seemed odd to me that they would have this triple distilled, designed to be light, delicate version of Springbank, and then mm -hmm. they would come out with a super cask forward, heavily, heavily 
cast sherry. And I understand why they want to do it, because it's a good whiskey. But I didn't mm. think it was a good representation of Hazelburn, necessarily. And I would, I would always recommend something along the lines of a, a 10. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, by all means, listen to Roddy. He doesn't get it. He doesn't understand. But I love this. I like the agricultural note that still exists in there. The DNA is still intact. I like the malt. I like the honey. I like the fact that it's, that it's lighter, but it still doesn't behave like you would expect a triple distilled. I think there's still quite a heavy body to it, despite all of that. Mm-hmm. Um, the triple distilled, you would think maybe something a bit more Irish in style, um, but it but it isn't not to my palate. I think no, a, no, it's the I see what you mean about that. The yeah. I think it's I think it's just uh, like the you know I sell booze for a living, so I try to appreciate everything. Yes, uh, and there's there's a couple of gaps that I just. It's a personal feeling, you know, so the Hazelburn is one that I don't get. And then the analogy, and I think it's maybe to do with lightness. Uh, in terms of beer, I don't like I, I, pills. I don't enjoy pills. You know, that sort of light Czech style lager. I just, again, I just don't get it. You need so, a, a hoppier. Yeah. Or, or maltier right. beer. You know, like a, if you get a Dunkel or a... A Kolsch or something, which is a sort of slightly heavier still, and I think maybe it's just a, you know, everybody's everybody's taste is unique to them. You know, we've all got different a different selection of taste receptors, and maybe I'm just missing the the Hazelburn taste receptors. You know, no, I, I know. I, I, it makes perfect sense to me. I, I mean, I genuinely. Um, I think it's, you know, how some people can pick up a bitterness in Brussels sprouts that others can't. And maybe it's something like that. Maybe it's maybe know. it's that hazel burn to you is what Auchentoshin is to me. Well, the, the, that's but, the thing, though. I like well, when you were here in When you were here in December, you brought a 22-year-old Auchentoshin, mm -hmm. and I declared it wonderful. Yeah. Because I was drinking it blind. But then it was quite a cask-forward one. So, you know, the... It could have been that you know you were appreciating the the wood elements more than the you know the wood was dominating over the spirit in that one. I think. Well, I also think because it was an independent, twenty-two years old, mm -hmm. and it was just a, a completely different take on Auchentoshin. Yeah, it um, was, wasn't it? Yeah. I, I think that 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 was uh, that that was what I, I remember trying to guess all over the place, and you had to lead me. I think for me to, to get anywhere. <laughs> Um, yeah. But it's that it's that thing that you need to be, and you've already kind of started to talk about that. I think when you talked about you sell drinks for a living, you're quite happy to to taste them, but it, remain open minded. Um, and one day you might happen across one that you think, oh, okay, this is a this is a decent dram, but you've mm -hmm. just you've never got Hazelburn. How do you feel about their double distilled peated expressions? How do you feel about the long rows? Yeah, I, long row, I love. Um, the uh, the long row reds, you know, they're they're all absolutely wonderful whiskies. The um, the, um, the standard long row, um, which I have somewhere. Uh, Not a uh, statement. Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, this one. Um, I think this is a a cracking whisky for the money. Um, you know, and it's a it's young whisky, but as you've said, Roy, you know, if it's PT, youth is fine. Youth and Pete go together, don't they? Yes. Um, and the uh, consistently, you know, when I when I when I think to do it, uh, long row eighteen is nearly always my in my top three whiskies, if not my whiskey of the year. You know, uh, again. You know when I talk about something being Moorish or pour one and you've had enough? Long Row 18 is, I have never owned a bottle of Long Row 18. And every time I've been poured one, I've always been like, why don't I own this? Because yeah. I just want to go back and go back and go back. And you know what it is, I think, I don't know if you'd agree with me on this, but Long Row 18, it's peated. It's probably the fullest bodied spring bank style let's say in terms of how the the distillation of but long row 18 is the most elegant spring bank mm -hmm. from their core range 
and I know it's batch, I know it's an annual release, but it's 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 an elegant whiskey to me. It's very there's a decadence about it. All that Campbelltown thing is still there. Um, it's complex, wonderfully complex. But there's you do feel I feel like every dram I've ever had of Long Row 18 has felt special to me. I I, I think uh, it Long Row 18 does. It, it follows the same path as as uh, PT Isla whiskies, which is you know the intense peat that you would find in a youthful version, evolves into fruit. By the time it gets to that age, you know that you, you taste an eighteen year old Bomor or or a um, you know a, a, a late teens Lagavulin or Lafroig, um, and Long Rose, to me, is doing the same thing. That, that that peak character has aged away, so you've lost the the heavy phenolic tarry expression of peat that you find in its youth and uh, it's evolved. And the peat heads come to this, and they spend the extra money looking for more, and they're often surprised that it's softer. It's a much more integrated thing. It's a much I, more. I, I love I love the way that peat evolves into that fruitiness with age. You know, me too. It, because you, you, you still get the, the smoke, you know, it's like you, you're drinking Long Row 18 or Lafroy 18 or whatever, and it's it's fruity. But then as the dram goes over, you know, as you swallow, then you get a wee hit of peat just in the finish to remind you Aye. That, it, that it's a peaty whiskey. I always liken it to like being at a party or being in a group of a company. And Pete is the big gregarious guy with the jokes and the loudest voice and the funny punchlines and everything. And you go into the room and you think, oh, that Pete guy, that's like, that's what a great guy that is. And then as, as you've been at the party for longer and Pete's calmed down a little bit and time's going on, you start to appreciate that everybody at the party, everybody in the company has got something to offer. Mm -hmm. and Pete is actually still enjoyable, <laughs> but you just settle down and calm down a wee bit. Aye, aye, aye. <laughs> you know, a wee bit like that. Multi Agus Muncher is saying, love the way. Uh, with peeling back the layers on long row and Greg is saying for me the best batch of long row 18 year old was the first 2008 but some batches 2011 were difficult to say the least the 2019 batch I tried is very good though I, I think um, the, go, ahead, go ahead well I, I I think one of the one of the strengths of Springbank and one of the reasons why it's so highly regarded by so many people um, and one of the reasons why Springbank survived when everything else in Campbelltown was was went by the wayside is that you know it's like I was saying about the 2019 12 year old I didn't like it to start with but let the bottle sit for six months and it was you know it was wonderful and in the same way you know you can have a long roll that that when you open it it's a sulfur bomb and you know you can't the enjoy it cherry cask yes but then if you you know you leave it for a few months and come back to it and it's calmed down and it's and you know if you talk to i'm sure you'll have had this experience talking to the, the springbank fans at the club roy you know the you know scott who is the most ardent fiercest defender of springbank yes he'll he'll tell you that some of the whiskies when you open when he opens them are horrible but he knows just to leave them for six months be and that, that's that, that. Yeah, that's a strength of the whiskey that it, it it's a complex thing. So it, you know, it's a living thing. So it'll evolve with time. Whereas perhaps a more a a cleaner spirit, homogenized might have, maybe, or <laughs> might have might have less less of a path to travel. You know, I have to say that one of the things I do love, and it's in keeping with what you're saying, it's in keeping with Greg's comment there. Springbank seem to embrace and celebrate batch variation. Yeah, they are a, they are a lesson. They are an educator. They they kind of they make no excuses or or they just we can easily sit down and pour different Springbank twelve cast strengths, different long row reds. Uh, obviously, long row reds are different uh, casks as well. Different expressions of the long row eighteen, and we can have them side by side if we want. And we can celebrate the fact that there are differences there. And for every down, um, 
it for every downward experience that we have where it's we, we maybe feel that it's not as good as the last one they will come back with something that's better um, mm -hmm. or, or back on to, to something that's more kind of to our subjective enjoyment I think I love mm -hmm. the idea that spring bank are not alone uh, in this generally I like producers that do seem to embrace batch variation mm -hmm. um, it's a bit like wine or, or like so many things that we enjoy in life if we start to chase consistency and try to provide a consistent product all the time you tend to end up finding yourself going towards the vanilla route and I don't mean vanilla and a vanilla flavor profile I mean it becomes it seems to be like that you might end up in a in a, in, a, in a route that takes you a bit more generic and um, a bit more homogenized a bit more I don't know um, Greg's Westgate is saying oh yeah Roy it is typical craft stuff not industrial mm -hmm. Nigel Slint is saying what an analogy I think he's perhaps talking about the guy at the party rather than what I've just said <laughs> Nigel Slynn as well he's just received a bottle there was a, a tour of Isla and one of our hosts the doc McAllen fine and rare at Lagavulin uh, he gave away a bottle of Lagville in 12, 2017, um, and Nigel Nigel Slynn won it. Roddy, if you've got a question in mind, if you can, while I'm announcing this, you come up with a question, I'm going to give away a flight of the whiskies that we've been enjoying together tonight, plus a couple of others in uh, Campbelltown whiskies. I'll give away the Coca Karen 8 cast strength, uh, obviously the Oloroso one, um, a dram of the Victoriana, the, Sp the Springbank cast strength, the Hazelburn, the long row red i'll pretty much give somebody a a, a wee uh, tasting set but in typical style of the v pub if you win this if you answer the question you're a knowledgeable guy Rod roddy's going to ask you something you're going to answer it you don't get those drums you nominate somebody else that you think <laughs> would deserve them somebody that's perhaps not been able to get their hands on the latest Kilkerran, somebody that you know that's a somebody that you think just strikes you as a nice guy somebody in the community whatever your motivation is a nice guy or a nice girl just nominate somebody else but you win the opportunity to gift these this flight of uh drums to somebody else have you got a question i know i'm putting you in the spot um Okay, this this is this will be, I think, a fairly easy question. So you'll get a lot of answers very quickly. It's whoever's um, first. <laughs> what year did Springbank first make the whiskey that's called Long Row now? So the, the there was a Long Row distillery in the nineteenth century, but the modern incarnation of Long Row. What year was that first made? I've written it in this piece of paper as a guess. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just going to. I know the answer, but I'm double checking. Okay, Chris Mayer is saying 1989. Uh, that's not what I have. Uh, I'm looking for. I'm looking for the first person that said that, Roddy. Uh, no, it's earlier than that. Oh. Ah, first made as opposed to released. Yeah, first the the year of first distillation. Sorry. Oh wow, okay. So in that case I know what it is because I know the age of the bottle that came out in 1987. <laughs> <laughs> um, Are you looking for the first person to say 1977? Uh, that's not the answer I was going to give. Okay, it's earlier than that then. What, what are we looking for Roddy so I can catch this? So 1973. Wow, Tomato Yoshi. Is saying 1973, and he was very early. There you are, then. Tomato Yoshi, superb, my friend. So all that's left for you to do is to nominate uh, Tomato Yoshi. I, I remember. I should remember who you are as well. I've forgotten. Um, is to nominate who that is going to, and I'll try and keep my eye on the chat until you've uh, decided who it can go to. But Roddy was looking for 1973. Epid is saying congrats to Mato Yoshi. Absolutely. I'm looking for his wee icon appearing again to see if... Uh, he's probably looking at the chat. I think it's harder to nominate somebody than it is to answer the question. <laughs> the, I would say nominate me, except I've tasted all the whiskies, so, you know. Uh... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You, I'm, I'm, I'd be very happy to send a flight across to you, Roddy, but 
it would um, be it would be superfluous, I think. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. A man who sells booze for a living. I know, I know. know. Yuri <laughs> Tomato Yoshi has said, "Ebhead, Rolf, there we go." Super, super, and Rolf, I know for a fact. Flight of Campbelltown to Ebhead. Uh, I know for a fact that Rolf will very much enjoy all of this. And I know that he's going to make a fuss of it on social media as well. Fantastic. That's good. My friend from Norway, Rolf Ebhead. I can't think of a nicer guy for it to go to. Thank good. you to Matt Yoshi. Superb, superb stuff. Will we get on with this quiz now? Right. Yeah, because I need to. I do. I am working in the morning, so. Right. Let's let's rattle through this like we've never yes. rattled through a quiz before. Multiple choice for if it's, if it's your first time. Hopefully, lots of you are hanging around. I know it's very very late, but if not, maybe some of you will be picking up in the replay. Um, it's multiple choice. Uh, you're only playing against yourself. There are no prizes, so if you get the point right, um, give yourself um, that point. But please, no googling. And if you do know, um, uh, perhaps not shout it from the rooftops because there's a lot of crowd leading happens sometimes. So the like, yep. Don't type it in the chat, no. Uh, for you, you don't type it in the chat. I'm going to ask you, and we've got a ten or so second delay. Okay. Ten or, ten or second so delay for you, um, but it's for the folk in the chat if, when they when right. they. Often, instead of just typing A, B, or C, they'll shout an exclamation mark and they'll um, and they'll, they'll lead the chat. And, and often they're right; they're a very knowledgeable crowd. But sometimes they do lead uh, everybody else as well. No googling, uh, as uh, as uh, Nigel was it Nigel Slynn said that. No, it was Ben Demon Hunter is saying no googling. No googling. Hey, Roddy, I know you're going to participate along with this, and this little icon here tells you that contributions tonight are from. Uh, Skogsmart, uh, who is also Nicholas. Thank you, Nicholas, for the questions. When a Nicholas question comes up, you'll know about it because it will have his, his icon there. The population of Isla is around 3,400, but what about Campbelltown? How many folk are in Campbelltown? Is it A, 2,200, B, 3,400, or C, 4,600? I think we just need to go through this quickly tonight, Roddy. I'm going to say C. You're going to, Roddy's going to, is that a guess? I thought it was more than that, so I'm going for the biggest number. And you consider the entire population of Isla with nine distilleries there. <laughs> 3,400, right? Mm -hmm. I can tell you that we're, we're starting off with a banana skin straight away because the crowd are all over the place. There is a lot of guessing. I appreciate very much that you guess and don't Google. Thank you so much. It is, in fact, C, 4,600. If you've answered C, give yourself a point. Well done. Gino got C, as well as Neil Cochran, Stu Baby, Peter Box, Too Slow. Quite a few of you get C, actually. Frank Rochford, thanks for your recent support, Frank. Good to see you in. Question two, which of the following distilleries is not an independent distillery? Not an independent distillery. A, Daft Mill, B, Eden Mill, C, Strath Mill. C. I, know you, I know you've got this, Roddy. I know you'll have this. Gabriel Welding is saying zero for one standard. <laughs> Sorry, Gabriel. <laughs> Cascode is saying zero for one. Good to see you in Cascode. Uh, Marvin Michlis is in. He's always a good scorer. Tomato Yoshi is zero. Uh, Peter Hunt, Vesper Tiger, Andrew Spurrell, Orange Wool, Peter Box. A few of you getting that first one. I can tell you that the non independent distillery is Roddy. C. Strathmore. Owned by? Uh, Diageo, isn't it? Yep. Only available as a flora and fauna. Graham Fraser is saying, Aquavita, I'm getting a delay on this, Roy. What you have to do is press refresh on your browser. You may have hit pause, or it might have paused. It might have buffered in some way. If you press refresh, it might jump forward, but you'll find that it syncs up. <laughs> Question three. Chris. In j and A Mitchell, what does the J and A stand for? Is it A, James and Alexander, B, John and Angus, or C, Joseph and Arthur? Question two, the one about Strathmill was a Scogsmart question. It was one of our... This is not, this is on the theme tonight. Jane A, is it James and Alexander, John and Angus, Joseph and Arthur? 
There's a huge amount of the crowd going for James and Alexander. Some think it's Joseph and Arthur. Roddy. Um, A. It is, of course, James and Alexander. James the father, Alexander the son. There was a brother, William, um, but they had a wee fallout one day <laughs> and they parted their ways. Um, so James and Alexander is the J and A and Mitchell. Well done if you said A. Question four. Another one from Scogsmard. Aurora Spirit is the northernmost whiskey distillery in the world. But where is it located? Where is Aurora Spirit? A, Norway, B, USA, or C, Canada. Now, obviously, I'm speaking about the most northern, so if it's the USA, it would have to be a northern territory. I would have to be Alaska, of course. <laughs> Norway, obviously, inside the Arctic Circle. Canada, lots of it inside the Arctic Circle. Where is the world's most northern distillery called Aurora Spirit? <laughs> I love seeing the speed of this chat. Can you see it moving? I can, yes. It's it's yeah. rattling up the screen. Yep. And of course, the crowd, very, very knowledgeable. They know indeed that it is. Rory, uh, sorry, Rory, did you know this one? I didn't know that one, no. Uh, the, if it's not Scotch whiskey, I'm, I'm horribly ignorant, I'm afraid. I'm sorry. You and I both. What would you guess? <laughs> the I was going to say Canada. Uh, it is in fact uh, Norway. Norway. Oh, well. Uh -huh. Norway Aurora, named after obviously the Aurora Borealis. Look at that picture. Look at that image. Quite a striking it's image. That is the distillery itself, Norwegian wow. distillery. And now the product they put out begins with a B. I can't remember what it's called. It's like Bevost or Brevost or something. Or, I don't know. Um, that's the name of the, the brand that they put out. Frank Rochford is cheering. He's saying four out of four. Yes. Now I think Frank is actually from Campbelltown. He is actually sponsored by one of the distillers down there. I want to say Springbank for playing his fiddle. Okay. Um, and uh, he's a professional fiddle player. Um, I hope I'm right, Frank. If I'm making a mistake, correct me in the comments. So anyway, if you answered A for Norway, give yourself a point. As we look at the image, question five is always a picture. And obviously, I'm <laughs> Roddy is looking at it going, what are we looking at here? Quite a fantastic picture, of course. Not a traditional distillery, but it is it's a distillery. It's really not. Is it A, Stowning, B, Floki, or C, Wolfburn? So again, we've got a northern theme going on here. Stowning would be... Um, where is, is Stowning? Is it Denmark, I think? I think no. it's Denmark. No. Floki is Iceland. We see Wolfburn is obviously... A, one of the most northern, uh, or the most northern mainland distillery. Jimmy uh, likes in B because Floki yeah. sounds great, even if they are <laughs> uh, flavour or drying the malt with sheep dung. It's one of their expressions. <laughs> it's one of their expressions. Scott Monroe was over in Iceland and he visited Floki, and he tried the sheep dung spirit, and he actually declared it to be uh, quite drinkable. I've I've tasted that. Blooming Frank Murphy in the pot still gave me a taste of that sheep dung whiskey blind. Uh, <laughs> didn't didn't tell me what it had been dry, peated with or dried with, smoked with till after I blooming tasted it. Um, How do you I, have a memory of it? Uh, I didn't enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> um, what would you guess? What distillery we're looking at? Uh, I'm, I'm going to go Floki as well because I like the name. It's Stowning in Denmark. Oh. Stowning. <laughs> so let's see if you answered A. Let's see how the scores are at the halfway point. Actually, I think what we'll do is we'll just catch it on the hop because I'm, I'm mindful of time tonight. So we'll just float straight into question six and ask another on theme question. The last two questions were from Scogsmart. This one, 1985, was a dark year for Campbellton Whiskey, but which distilleries were still open in 1985? Was it A, only Springbank in Glen Scotia? B, only Springbank? Or C, none? Nineteen eighty five. 
We're both quiet here, Roddy. I'm just watching the, the chat going down here. You know, you know this answer. You know it, don't you? Uh, yeah. I'm, can I can I say it? Yes. Go ahead. I'm going to go see. Absolutely. 1979 Springbank closed, and in 1984 Glen Scotia also closed its doors. Um, the next one was 1987 to open up again when Springbank began operations again. Um, uh, I think it was 87, going from memory. Um, but I checked this out earlier. In 1985, as well as I believe 1986, there was no whiskey being made mm. in Campbelltown. It's just really dark days. I'm so glad that we're in a situation now where not only are three producing again, but they're in rude health and making great whiskey. So if you answered C, none. No distilleries was the right answer. Question seven, a Scogsward question. The famous Grouse Smoky Black was initially released under another name. What was it? Was it A, the Smoky Grouse, B, the Black Grouse, or C, the famous Grouse Peated? Famous Grouse, Smoky Black. I believe, Roddy, that famous Grouse is still the most popular blend sold in Scotland. A uh it could be. I'm, I'm again. If it's not malt whiskey, I'm not. I'm not very. Yeah. You know, I get very hand wavy if it's not malt. Um, and yet, you probably know this, right? The I'm going to go with B. You think it's black grouse? Yeah. So the famous grouse. I mean, I think there is smoke in the famous grouse, but it's only a wee puff of smoke. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But they did a. a, a a smoky version, and indeed they did call it the Black Grouse. So like so many of the very knowledgeable crowd, answering B, absolutely spot on. The Black Grouse okay. is the right answer. <laughs> Thanks for that, Scogsmard. Question eight, which of these was once a Campbellton distillery? Oh, banana skins perhaps. Uh -huh. A, Ben Moore. B, Ben Dunn. C, Benachy. Which of those was once upon a time a Campbelltown distillery? Now, what's amazing is when you go through a book of our closed dis distilleries, the one I was reading earlier today is, is the Brian Townsend book that you know, Roddy, I think, Scotch aye, Myth. Aye, aye. Um, there is a huge selection of whiskies just from that tiny town in that book. Um, but is one of them A, Ben Moore, B, Ben Dune, or C, Ben I'm, um, I'm, I'm trying to say B with a straight face. <laughs> I'm, going think, go I'm going to go C, Ben Achey. Ben Achey. Roddy thinks C. This is definitely a banana skin. Um, is that one now a dairy? Whiskey loving pianist is said, saying, Is that one now a dairy? A dairy? <laughs> I can tell you that it's Ben no. Moore. <laughs> ben Dun, of course, is a figment of my imagination. And uh, Ben <laughs> he was very much also a figment of my imagination. Um, so it was indeed Steve A. You're absolutely spot on a banana skin. Absolutely. And yet, Bill. <laughs> Bill Balistreri, good, good to have you in as a supporter as well recently on Patreon. Bill, thank you so much. Um, he is celebrating. <laughs> and Gino is saying a carpet burner, talking about the spider. <laughs> Dancing Midgey, five out of eight so far. Ebhead is admitting a banana skin. Tom Goosen, seven out of eight. I wonder if the banana skin was that one that caught you out, Tom. I do apologize. Let's move on to the second from last and ask. Glen Gale Distillery was previously closed in A, 1896, B, 1925, or C, 1938? Nice easy one for the penultimate question because we did mention this and share this with you earlier. I think it was Roddy that mentioned it, so I think Roddy's got it. The, um, I'm gonna go C. Oh wow, really? <laughs> You sure you don't want to change your mind? <laughs> <laughs> no, I've committed myself. There was uh, one Campbelldown distillery that managed to creep into the, the 1930s 
uh, that wasn't Springbank and it wasn't Glen Scotia, but it wasn't Glen Gale either. Oh, for God's sake. Is it, is that Reclachan? Reclachan managed to make it into the 30s, yes. So the, right, so they were, they spent money in Glen Gale, but it wasn't actually operating. Uh, beyond that, perhaps. They stopped distilling yeah. in 1925. The, I was, you know, we were talking the other night, Roy, about uh, David Stark's book. Yeah. Uh, after which I was, I was sort of leafing through it, and I'm fairly sure that they were spending money at Glengyle in the 30s. So they they spent the money and then never managed to make anything. Okay, the ones that I used was Scotch Mist and uh, the Malt Whiskey Yearbook for Glengyle. No, I'm 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 sure that's right. I'm just. Uh, in fact, the easiest one to look at will be Glen Glengyle, and here. Um, I actually thought that you mentioned this earlier in the stream. Well, they, 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 I've, I've, I've clearly misremembered it because of my memory from reading... Listen, if you have, it just it just makes me feel wonderful about my terrible, terrible memory, <laughs> especially when it comes to recent <laughs> things. Uh, here in this Malt Whiskey Yearbook, it says 1925. Right. Um, right. And, uh, and if I quickly try to see if I can pull it out of here as well. Glenn. There's too many Glens. Jeez. And if you look at closed Glens. <laughs> My God. Glen Gale, Glen Gale, Glen Gale. Yeah. Two, three. So, um, so this is, this is a... Uh, 1925, it says in Scotch Mist as well. Yep. Yeah, this is David Stark's book that we were talking about the other night. Uh, you can have a wee look at that. Everybody, <laughs> the whiskey scout is saying he's off for his reference, full of banana skins. Yeah. Right, let's see. Okay, one more to do. Just turn in your scores, guys, and tell me how you're doing at a nine. Steve A, five out of nine tonight. He's got a pass mark precarious Dave as well on six, as well as Mikey Hay. Good to see you, Mikey. Uh, Tom Goosen's on seven. He's already passed the, the pass mark. Let's see if there's any higher ones Greg's whiskey done. Oh, it's been a tough quiz tonight, I think, again. Uh, Casco done 8 out of 9, great score. Any 9 out of 9s? Looks like 8 out of 9 is our highest. It doesn't look like anybody's got a 9 out of 9. Right. So, yeah, the just the Bloch brothers... Um, That's right. ...who owned Glen Scotia made arrangements to buy Glengyle, but then clearly they've never actually done anything with it. That's, That's right, and, it, and it's it's actually interestingly the Block Brothers' ownership of that brand, Glengyle, that stopped Kilcarran bottling it as Glengyle to this day. Uh -huh, uh -huh. The legacy of that. Yeah. Daniel Vermas is on 9 out of 9 again. Daniel Vermas is killing it. That guy is some kind of whiskey super professor. Swat. I mean, he's been killing even the tough quizness, quizzes he's been doing. Daniel Vermas is 9 out of 9. Superb. Okay, let's see if question 10 can catch out Daniel. It's a Scogsmart's question. It's not me that's made this. Which distillery's bottles have appeared the most on recycled reviews? A, Balblair, B, Deanston, C, Lagavulin. Even Roddy's shaking his head at this thinking this is an ass hat question. If ever I've happened upon one. The, I need to think about what you like to drink, Roy. Yes. Whiskey. Um, well, yes. Aye, very good. Um, I actually think that Scogsmard has been clever enough to weave that into the the options here. He's made this very tricky, I have to say. Jimmy Legg is saying B or C. <laughs> you know what? I'm I, 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 I'm going to go B, Deanston, because because uh, you've heard me bang on about Deanston. Well, just the, the last time we were talking about Deanston, you were comparing it to a. Uh, a favourite, a favourite Highland distillery of ours. Yes, I, 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 um, and I, I, uh, I, 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 yeah, that that's my theory anyway. Because because you like Clinleash a lot, and you see that you've said in the past about you see a, a character, a, a textural character that's also in Deanston. It's not always in Deanston, but it's sometimes in Deanston, and when it's there, yeah. it's there. Right. Um, mm -hmm. I think the purest experience is probably the organic. Right. Uh, 
everybody is agreeing with you, Roddy. It looks like the vast majority <laughs> seems to think that indeed. But what's really interesting is just it's not. I was surprised how many Deanstons are in there. See, what what I do is I have a a shared spreadsheet online that people can link to, and people can go in and see my scores at any time, so that when they're in a shop or something, they can pull up a spreadsheet in a very low data rate, right, rather than a video. Or, um, mm -hmm. And they, so that if you sort it by alphabetical order, all the Deanstons are stacked there. Um, but there's no duplication. It's all different Deanston expressions. Michael Taylor is saying fanboy. Absolutely. Well, fanboy for as long as they keep bringing good whiskey. I won't remain a fanboy of the brand. I'll only ever remain a fanboy of the whiskey. Ebhead is saying, I used, I used my once in a lifetime option to choose two answers, B and C. Gives me a pass map, five out of 10, Aquavite. <laughs> the, so, he's making up the rules as he goes along. <laughs> that's fine. That's absolutely fine. He's only playing against himself, Roddy. What's uh, your score for tonight then? Me? Seven? Oh, I think about five or six. No, you, I think. Uh, I, th I only counted you getting three wrong, unless I've missed. So well, you're only, you're, uh, the, the pass mark tonight, I suppose, is five, as it always is, but a celebratory mark to really celebrate is to beat Roddy. Oh, for God's sake. So, so if, got if you get eight, seven or more? Eight, eight, seven or better. Let's see, I'm looking for Daniel Vermas. Where are you, Daniel? Did you manage your 10 out of 10? Are we raising a glass to say congrats to the man in Hungary? Maybe he's been modest. Maybe he's just hiding his light under a bushel. But I know Daniel, and I don't think that's true. I've just missed the comment. <laughs> no, I can't find him. Somebody help me. Eric Evanson is saying, best score ever on a quiz. Do I win anything? Joking. Good quiz. Well done with 8 out of 10, Eric. That's a superb score. Marvin is saying a solid 7 out of 10 tonight. You usually scored very well. Well done. Love the quiz as always. Fantastic. Glad you enjoyed it. Multi Haggis Muncher is saying 200 thumbs up. Do I get a prize? No, but you get a heartfelt thank you from me, Matthew. Thank you so much. Thank you all for staying with me and indulging me. This is a three hour live stream. <coughs> Absolutely ridiculous. And thank you to my guest, you star. I knew I was probably going to be asking you to stay a wee bit late tonight, but I didn't imagine it would be a full hour later. <laughs> I don't think it would have been any different if you were sat next to me, honestly, Roddy. It's uh, wonderful to have you along. I hope you enjoy it. Everybody that tunes in, yes. they enjoy hanging out with you as well. I certainly do. Um, the social distancing is a pain in the ass, but the technology is a nice stand-in, I think. Mm -hmm. And it's good that we were able to sort of synchronise drums quite well too. We, we did uh, no bad. <laughs> Funny aye, that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to raise what's left of my uh, Springbank 12 cast strength. For a sign off tonight, Roddy, you can stay in if uh, if if you want, and we can once uh once we kill the stream, I can say thank you to you. Um, but uh, I do appreciate your time, and I do appreciate you coming along, and I hope that you are able to sit next to me in real life in the near future. In the meantime, the, uh, um, can you wait for the club to get going again? Hi, me too. My me too. I'll raise a glass to everybody for joining us tonight. I'll raise a glass to everybody that's out there working while we are all sitting at home on the couch complaining. Everybody that's keeping our functions going, our lights on, the frontline healthcare staff, everybody that's doing the job out there to keep the world turning, I'll raise a glass to you as well and thank you all. Um, I'm available tomorrow night. I'm appearing on the Tomat and Stream tomorrow with uh, Scott and Barrett the Scottish Test Dummies. And of course, there'll be an extended opening, a much more relaxed stream on Sunday night that will be less than two hours. Thank you all for your fabulous support everywhere and thank you for hanging out with us tonight i hope you've had a bit of fun and i hope you've enjoyed listening to roddy as much as i have roddy slanjava cheers slanjoy slanjava oh, there we go good night my friend thank you okay. <laughs>